What is up, everyone, and welcome to The Wen Show! We've got a lot of great topics for you today, starting with the passing of controversial Bill C-11 here in Canada. Or should I call it Kanakistan? <laughs> I mean, I've, I've heard people call it worse, especially people who are not in Canada and don't really understand what being in Canada is all about. But that doesn't mean that C-11 isn't a cause for concern. We're going to be talking about that. Also a cause for concern, AMD's Ryzen X3D CPUs have been dying, um, though they've apparently rolled out a fix now. So we're going to get you guys the update on what's going on with that. What else we got? I'm looking for stuff. Uh... But you don't want to talk about dead Chromebooks? Oh, sure. What, you don't want to talk about my impending cosmetic procedure? Cheap laptops die and are annoying to repair. I mean, yeah. More at 11. Impending cosmetic procedure? What? Well, let's just leave it there. What? The show is brought to you today by MSI, Vessi, and AkiFlow. All right, let's jump right into, obviously, the big topic of the week. Should we just abandon our... Should we leave Canada? Our, should we abandon our Canadian roots, make yeah. the long trek 30, 20 minutes. 36 minutes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to the southern border and... Uh, and and join our join one of our former colleagues down in down in uh, Americaville. Former colleagues. Yeah, 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 yeah. John moved down there. Oh, I thought you were talking about John. Oh yeah, well I, I like, mean, he's no, not he's a former. Colleague. Yeah, no, he still works here. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. well, not here, here, but here, here. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The greater here. Let's talk about why this is even a topic of conversation. Bill C eleven has been passed into. The into Canadian law as the Online Streaming Act after two and a half years of debate, a uh, debate that I actually did get involved in at one point back when it was known as C10, making my way all the way to the uh, assistant deputy minister. No, I think it was the deputy minister of, you know, whoever was actually working on this. I can't, I can't remember. It's actually been quite a while. I remember being on the set of one of our early car videos might have been the model Y video or something like that. And I, I was, I had this call, um, on the racetrack <laughs> with the, with this like deputy minister or whatever. And it became very clear to me at that time that well, I mean, well, okay, this won't be a surprise to anyone, but it became very clear to me that the whole thing was political, oh, had yeah. nothing to do with actually, you know, protecting creators, or, you know, however they were trying to sell it. Um, and at, at the end of the day was about, you know, figuring out a way to extract money from online streaming platforms. And then as far as I could tell, waste it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I have a lot of thoughts based on my experience, both with uh, Canadian production services tax credits, as well as um, just generally interfacing with the government of Canada. And as, as far as I can tell, uh, most of the funding exists only for entities that are so large and well-established that they can afford both the time and money to cut through yeah. the bureaucracy and therefore don't need it. It's a lot of work. The, the companies that I know that capture it very effectively have dedicated employees that are there to capture it. Yeah, which is like, oh man, not the, po not the point. Yeah. Anywho, let's go back to the talking points, shall we? Originally known as Bill C-10, the act allows the Canadian government to impose regulations on streaming platforms like Netflix and Spotify, as well as social platforms like YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok through the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission, or the CRTC. Proponents say, so these would be supporters, that C-11 simply brings online platforms under the same kind of rules that have applied tr to traditional broadcasters for decades, requiring them to promote Canadian content and contribute financially to Canadian content production. But critics, including many Canadian content creators like Renee Ritchie, Some Ordinary Gamers, Call Me Chris, and JJ McCullough, are worried that the law could affect content that's made by influencers slash content creators, like independent creators, 
um, since the act will likely force platforms to change their recommendation algorithms to serve Canadian users more CanCon or Canadian content. And this is a very real uh, concern, not just because of the moves the Canadian government is making, but because of what I fear an entity like Google might do to retaliate. So let's, and you know what? <sighs> this is a tough one for me to approach because these are all private conversations. Ah, uh, yeah. But, and no one said anything to me directly because that would have been insane. <laughs> But I will tell you, from conversations I have participated in, whether directly or uh, observationally, that Google's not happy about any of this, and that if they are forced to alter the way that they serve content to Canadian viewers, they might, you know, you never know, something might happen to the way that content from Canadian creators gets served outside of Canada. Yeah, like it sounds all uh, all neat for Canadian creators when you hear what Canada wants. But when you think about how anybody's going to react to it, your algorithmic priority outside of Canada is going to be damaged because of your alg algorithmic priority inside of Canada. Potentially, potentially. I, and I'd say pro I have been in none of these conversations. So I would say probably, but I have no idea. Well, see, the thing is, even if Google decided... You know what? Forget it. I mean, what's the point of being petty and spiteful here? Uh, if if LTT's viewership is 6% within Canada, why would we want this to have any impact on their ability to for their pro content to propagate outside of Canada? Why are we depriving other users of this content? That's I mean, that's ridiculous. But hold on a second. If the Canadian government passes this law, which they now have, and decides to actually do something with it, which at this point is still very unclear, actually. Um, well, they probably won't be the last. Yeah. I mean, if I'm Turkey or Japan or think... anywhere, really, um, anywhere that's more of a... I, okay, I shouldn't have said Japan then, but anywhere that's more of a cultural importer rather than exporter... Um, and I'm anywhere that I want to, uh, you know, protect my my local production industry. Well, I'm looking at this going, oh, OK, so you actually can just tell big tech, no, you may not have a closed black box algorithm that uh, just kind of recommends whatever and doesn't promote you know, local or at least within ge ar arbitrary geographical boundary X uh, content. And so ultimately, the impact could end up coming for us, not because of Canada's first move on this, but because of the other dominoes that may ultimately fall over the next yeah. two or five or 10 or 25 years or whatever that time frame ends up looking like. Uh, let's do continue here, though. The government has said, the Canadian government, to be clear, has said that the act is not meant, this is italicized, thank you, Wan Show writer, uh, to affect user-generated content. So it, so it theoretically shouldn't affect someone like a Call Me Chris, but then, in spite of them saying that, they rejected multiple amendments that would have specified that in the law. So as it is now, it's pretty much just left to the CRTC to decide how to enforce this. Um, and if they do ultimately go that route with it, well, that's within their power. So the law was designed to give the CRTC as broad powers as they were able to get pushed through over the last two and a half years. And as a an independent content creator that more and more, at least according to many of you, is basically a you know corporate media machine, um, I have no idea where I fall in this. How, how does Linus Media Group Incorporated figure into this? Am I an independent content creator or am I a media corporation? <laughs> both? I think both, you're both is good. Yeah, I don't know. Right? <sighs> okay, so let's, um, let's, let's keep moving on. One uncontroversial effect of the law could be the widening, though, of the definition of what legally constitutes Canadian content. Uh, Heritage Minister Pablo Rodriguez is reportedly likely to ask the CRTC to include content such as Pixar's Turning Red, which is an American movie, right? Produced by an American company, but 
written by a Canadian, set in Toronto, and produced by a partially Canadian crew, and also HBO's The Handmaid's Tale, which is an American show set partially in Canada and based on books by a... Uh, Luke, your phone. And based on books by a Canadian author with a partially Canadian crew. Um, neither of those would qualify under the current CanCon rules. What's really stupid about the current CanCon rules is how difficult it is to prove it. Like, <laughs> look at... This is ridiculous. Uh, what is a Canadian certification? Minimum of 75% of program expenses, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what is the points? What is the point system? Okay, so the director gives you two points. Um, DP gives you one point. Um, I mean, or two points, depending on what kind you're talking about. But the director of photography gives you one point. Uh, there's some special rules. The point is... <laughs> like the single point, um, the government hasn't <laughs> been super clear about how this is going to work because they aren't the ones making the actual rules. That's the job of the CRTC, who are going to take consultation for 30 days at least before publishing a draft. So our discussion questions are as follows. Oh, this is fun. How will the government force platforms to finance Canadian content? I mean, this that's a really interesting one because so far... If Google simply says, well, I'm not going to pay, um, I don't think that the Canadian government has shown any inclination to simply block Google services within the borders. So that would be so incredibly destructive. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be that would be pretty bad and pretty stupid. Um, however, again, this is from my conversations that I've witnessed slash been a part of. Um, it is my understanding that Google intends to comply with whatever law ultimately ends up um, happening so c11 they they intend to comply with c11 so i guess you know that's not a probable outcome so then what will that look like is it potentially a good thing that we could get more because okay if they have to alter the alg algorithm they have to somehow demonstrate that they're altering the algorithm they have to be more transparent about how it works does that have a potential small upside here for everyone and the thing that i don't really understand is like, if I go to YouTube, I wonder if this is gonna happen here because it's logged into a different account. Uh, it did not happen here. And I don't know if this is because I click on this content sometimes or what, but when I go on my personal YouTube, uh, it's never at the top, but if I scroll down a little bit, there's like a what's going on in Canada section already. Like, I don't know. I know that that was one of the solutions that Google had proposed was like a non-algorithmic solution where they occupy a certain amount of screen space. Yeah. Like that, that um, happens to my personal account for sure. It is almost always like government news, like like Trudeau's face is all over it, like over half the content. I okay. swear. Um, I don't. I don't get like random Canadian, 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 mm, less Canadian, but okay, guy. <laughs> I mean, this is probably just because I'm yeah. signed in as me, so it's just all our accounts because I don't really watch a lot of YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, well, why don't I try an incognito tab then? Not that that's necessarily going to make much difference, but... Yeah, I've got someone in Flowplane chat saying they get the same thing in the UK. So this is definitely a thing. Yeah, okay. It might not be all users. It might only be users that interact with it when shown. Uh, like, I don't, I don't exactly know how it works. But this is a system that they already have to a certain degree. Interesting. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't see anything here. Maybe it's just because I'm not signed in at all? Yeah, if you're not, if you're not like, this this one is uh, signed into, like, the WAN show email thing that yeah. we set up. And I, I don't have it at all here. I just have it on. And I don't know that I've seen it on my work account. I just know that I've seen it on my personal account. So I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a few other people saying that they get the same thing. Uh, someone's saying that they get the same thing in the U.S. even. So this is this is definitely a thing. Uh, I don't know that everyone gets it. Uh, yeah, someone's same in Chicago, same as the U.S. Another person saying they've never seen it in the U.S. I don't know who all has access to it. But this is definitely something that they've experimented with. And that's enough, in my opinion. Like, it would be cool if they mixed in content creators from that area instead yeah. of just like government news yeah because that's like right now it's just like trudeau seven times and then you can scroll to the right to see if there's more but it'd be cool if it was like yeah maybe one or two like what's happening in my country i'm not against that but then some other content creators spattered in would be kind of neat um yeah i think a, a, a local tab yeah 
would be sweet uh, would be a positive thing yeah. for the platform honestly sure. like we the fact that local news is basically dead at this point between the decline of newspapers and the consolidation of local tv stations it makes it kind of hard to figure out what the heck's going on yeah, around that's you that's a bad thing i mean yeah. so what i i i just rely entirely on r slash vancouver yeah like that sucks is that I'm not going to join a Facebook group? That that is that is an option. Like it my, is yeah, like you, Yvonne's in like the you know or the neighborhood the group neighborhood or whatever. Yeah. the neighborhood Facebook group and just like I okay. On the one hand, I'm saying look, more local content definitely a good thing. On the other hand, I don't need to know that there's a raccoon in your yard. <laughs> It's like the, the level of granularity. Yeah, I, I just I wish there was a bit of vetting uh, uh, before it hits my eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. Could so anyone like, else possibly be interested in this? No. Okay, maybe not then. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So like having options like that is cool, but changing the general algorithm, like no, I don't want that. What if I am specifically into uh, scientific Japanese stuff? culture? Yeah, sure. Yeah, something. I don't need videos on Japanese culture only from like Canadian creators. Yeah, probably not. Why would I care if that's what I was coming here for? So I guess you have already really given me your 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 thoughts then on our second discussion question, which is how do you feel about CanCon in general? Do you think Canada should attempt to protect its culture from the evil Americans? <laughs> and I put that in finger quotes because in Canada there is. A, a pretty big perception that um, culturally we're we're pretty much just like um, melting pot. America's hat. Yeah, we don't um, really have our own. Yeah, we we have a lot of you know cultural imports and very few cultural exports. Like it's mostly it's mostly things that people meme on. It's like oh, Tim Hortons was ruined. Maple syrup. Yeah, and <laughs> hockey. Yeah, uh, you know. Hey, those are pretty good. Look, maple the ones syrup. We got are pretty solid. Curling. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not like it's not like we're complaining about the things that are that are uniquely Canadian, but we are largely a culture importer for sure. But a lot of the a lot of our like actors, actresses, musicians, stuff like that end up going down to the States and being perceived as American creators. Um, and, and yeah, like if I yeah. I would like, a, a, like you said, a local tab yeah. or and like below my main boxes, like a, a bar that has local content, that'd be cool. But that's it. I don't want any more than that. And like, uh, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, influences during your formative years, I guarantee you a lot more young kids in Canada watched Friends than Kim's Convenience, right? Like yeah. it's Kim's Convenience is great, though. Sure. But like I found it wasn't hard for me to find. I didn't go looking for. I'm sure it wasn't influenced by this because this didn't exist yet. I think a big problem for me, too, is what exactly constitutes Canadian content. Because even if we ignore the heavy cultural imports, um, like you alluded to already, Canada is such a mixing pot, at least in the urban centers, which is the vast majority of the population here, that Canadian content could be basically anything because it's defined by your citizenship. So if you have a Canadian citizenship then okay it's canadian content now but it's like well what do you, what even is that i don't know yeah um i don't know it's it's a funny thing the whole the whole sort of cultural pride thing is something that i observe in foreigners a lot um but not something that i can really relate to um you know okay on the subject of our of our friend john who still works for us yes um but he's based down in in one of the carolinas I, I'm, I know which one i'm just not saying which one i have no idea how don't need to narrow it down more than that yeah i don't need to narrow it down more than that over no. there I, I think he's pretty public about where he lives but i i don't feel like checking right now it's fine anyway the point is he's over on on, on the east in the east in the u.s um and like you know for him it's it's a it's often a source of like great pride that a particular hot sauce or whatever was uh Sports was teams yeah, sports teams. I mean, sports teams, I want to sort of get to that later because sports teams, I think, are sort of universal, at least in North America. I think people form relationships with regional sports teams. But for me, the big one was, you know, monuments or or people that came from the same school. Like he would feel a sense of personal pride or a sense of personal shame when people from his from his post-secondary institution went on to do great things or very terrible things. Right. And that's something that I don't know, maybe it's because I don't really know anything about my own heritage <laughs> that I've just never been able to relate to i don't i don't, yeah, I don't we get did it. a really intensely bad job of this before this bill and this bill is not going to help 
Like, if, if you were trying to foster Canadian heritage, this is not the way to do it. And, I mean, honestly, I don't think anyone thinks it will. Not really. Yeah. Um, as far as I could tell, you know, the justifications that were provided to me, uh, and, and they, they were extremely, uh, you know, well articulated, but if you got even past the very, very, very skimming top skin of the surface, didn't make any sense. It's like, well, you know, how are we going to make sure that Canadian stories get told? And I'm sitting here going, well, I don't know, you could tell Canadians to pick up a f***ing cell phone and tell their story. And if anyone wants to hear it, if it's an interesting story, then you know what's great about the internet, the way that it is right now without you mucking around with it, is that they can tell that story and anyone, be they Canadian or American or... Letterkenny you know, and Shorzy are both intensely that's Canadian. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know you guys haven't seceded yet. <laughs> <laughs> Lone Star. Um, the, uh, Letterkenny and Shorzy are both intensely Canadian pieces of content yeah amazingly good uh the language and stuff gets pretty intense i could be talking to kids i wouldn't necessarily recommend that you watch it if you're an adult though it's fantastic content um and it's popular outside of canada and it like really displays a lot of like intensely canadian culture um so that's it's great it's made very well and it went very far and it's still continuing to go very far with shorzy um it's possible we do it things happen yeah and i mean i guess for me I, you know part of my part of my cynicism comes from how difficult it was to actually get funding as a small time creator so when the justification given to me is like well how do we fund uniquely canadian stories like one of the examples That's, given to me i just want to interject because yeah. the way that you said it made it sound like it's no longer difficult oh yeah it's still very difficult yeah we're, aren't we still waiting for stuff from like years ago like 2019 or something like that yeah, yeah. Like, like pandemic was over a while ago, y'all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like that that type of funding timeline. I mean, sorry, sorry, excuse me. Pandemic was over a while ago, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that that cultural influence from the south has taken over. Uh, Yeehaw! <laughs> we're ar we're already moving. We're out the door. <laughs> we'll be there in a minute, America. Um, but <laughs> those funding timelines don't work. If you're not 100% funding yourself already. Yeah. So like, what a failure. Yeah. I. Ugh. And like, you know, the example, one of the examples that was given to me of, you know, the kind of story that could be told. Because I, I challenged that, right? I went, well, what story? Uh, what, what story is not told right now? I'm like, oh, well, you know, what about the story of an Anglophone? That means an English speaker. Uh, an Anglophone living in an all French community. <laughs> like, okay. what, what about it? So tell that story, and then when nobody fucking cares, then we can all move on with our day. <laughs> and then if someone some does, of making it funny yeah. or very well written or something, which is possible, then you'll find success. I don't do well. And maybe this is just like what's it called, survivorship bias or something like that. Survivorship bias. Here we go. Here we go. Survivorship bias is a type of sample selection bias that occurs when an individual mistakes a visible successful subgroup as the entire group. So sure. I, I definitely experienced survivorship bias because I did make it through the gauntlet of, uh, of breaking out on social media, right? And so I'm looking at it going, well, if you keep pounding your fists at that wall long enough, eventually you'll, you could break it down. Uh, and, but maybe that's not true and maybe that's not fair and maybe that story does need to be told. But then my question you know so my rebuttal to that is is it really being told if you create the content so you throw money at this thing and then 46 people watch it yeah because like it'll show up in people's algor algorithms but how these platforms work you don't have to watch that thing yes you would have to click on it to watch it so it's just not going to get clicked so they're on. treating this like tv where the audience is captive to a degree but that's not the case. You still don't have to click on things. And it, it comes down to that age old philosophical debate. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, does it make a sound, right? I would make the argument that a story told in an empty room in the dark has not been told. It's just been conceived of, you know, like it's not, it, 
That, is it a story if it's not passed along to anybody? The empty room in the dark thing doesn't really work, but I do agree with the. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can definitely tell stories. Well, I was just trying to. I was trying to paint a dark. lonely picture. Yeah. <laughs> There's no microphone. <laughs> It's not a sleepover. The uh, room is empty. <laughs> it's dark. There's no lights even. Okay, because the energy could be converted to matter. It's fully empty. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I don't see necessarily a lot of or any value to that. Because like we we know how brutal it is to try to get clicked on. Yeah, right? I know. So like, so I'm not against funding Canadian content. Yeah, I just don't want it funded because it's Canadian content. I want it funded because it's good. Like it's the same way. Like man, I see I see a lot of people you know challenge me because generally speaking, I am I am pro uh, I am pro societal good. I I don't mind paying my taxes. Right. Um, and people will challenge me on that and go, well, yeah, but what about government waste? What about it? Yeah, it fucking sucks. Not into it, even a little. Like, I spend my life trying to make things efficient around me, and the fact that an entire sort of subclass of, 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 of citizens exists to utilize my money in a way that's not efficient, is it's bullshit, right? Obviously. But the flip side of that is that I also do run a company now that is small or medium depending on how you measure it and i understand that when you scale past a certain point bureaucracy is unavoidable waste is just a fact of life and so i don't know i'm i'm split because i do need roads to drive on i do need hospitals to visit i do need an education system for my kids to participate in right like there are there are actual greater good benefits that taxes do allow for um but yeah that doesn't mean that i'm not mad when it gets wasted and this is one of those cases where i look at it and i go all right well i mean you like had this money and as far as i can tell a lot of it gets wasted either on like as a as a subsidy for foreign companies you know like it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me how much animation takes place in canada for example and how few canadian media companies there are <laughs> yeah what why why are they why are they all just working for american companies so it seems to me that there are systemic problems that need to be solved before you just go grab more cash from online streaming platforms and then sort of vaguely have some idea of how you're going to use it to something something canadian story something like i just i don't know man um frustrated yes yeah, frustrated. Yep. Frustrated enough to actually, you know, pick up and leave? Honestly, no. Like if, It's so incredibly if, difficult at this point. So there's that. And, you know, honestly speaking, um, how, how, does, how does the old biblical thing go? Uh, wor wor worry not about the splinter in your neighbor's eye until you've removed the two by four from your own or something <laughs> like that. Like um, if, 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 if as an American... You are outraged by how ridiculous this C11 thing looks. Um, you know, it, it's not perfect anywhere. There's other stuff going on. Is what I'm kind of trying to say. And overall, the perception that a lot of consumers of American, particularly American media, seem to have of Canada um, is just simply not correct. Uh, not even close. Uh, like there's there's I, I i often see comments about you know what life must be like in the canadian you know societal hellhole um and it's it's a particular i think this is true about like basically everywhere though no not really i don't know I don't see it from a lot of europeans and it's not that they're not talking to me like i i i, I, I read oh i see okay no what i what i meant is yeah. that like if you if you watch media or like news from a certain country that when you show up it's different than what you might have expected no it's just that there are there are some types of american media and there's some consumers of american media certain types of american media that seem to be under the impression that canada is some kind of dystopian hellscape um it's pretty chill and it's there's things i could complain about for days but absolutely it's pretty chill overall yeah 
Um, I have a lot of questions here. I mean, we've got Dangered Wolf asking, would you consider creating an American branch of LMG even if LMG remains based in Canada? Why would I do that? Now I get to deal with the broken-ass American tax system Oof. on top of the broken-ass Canadian tax system. Super fun. Incredibly fun. How about no? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, in Canada, we don't have guns, so I need... How about no? <laughs> um... <laughs> By the way, we do have we guns. We do have guns, yeah. Just... <laughs> we have a lot of guns. <laughs> I don't personally, actually, but Colton does. Which is why we've never actually fired him. <laughs> <laughs> there was, there was uh, quite a few years ago, there was a point in time where the like firearms per capita in Canada was like very, very high. Uh, but it was a lot of, yeah, I'm not even going to get into it, but yeah. We have, we have <laughs> Float guns. plane chat, finger knife. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you. <laughs> hey, from within, what is it? Six feet, eight feet, or something Somewhere like that. Knife's there. more lethal than a gun. Yeah. What, whatever that that yeah. conventional wisdom is. Yeah. Why don't we roll into our next topic? AMD is rolling out a fix for burnt Ryzen X three D CPUs. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, pop this up here. This is originally covered by Extreme Tech, I think. Well, uh, maybe not originally, but they're one of the sources we've got. Oh, and OnTech has covered this as well. All right, so here you go. This is a good look at the picture here. Whew. Yikes. That's a, that's a spicy CPU socket right here. Uh, AMD released an official statement. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, we have root-caused the issue and have already distributed a new AGISA that puts measures in place on certain power rails on AM5 motherboards to prevent the CPU from operating beyond its specification limits, including a cap on SOC voltage at 1.3 volts. This doesn't affect their ability to overclock memory using Expo XMP kits or boost performance using PBO technology. Um, they are expecting this fix to roll out through all of their board partners, and blah 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 apparently asus and msi had already implemented their own fixes prior to amd and had suggested that excessive voltages in expo memory profiles had allowed the soc voltage to reach unsafe levels Whew. um they did not clarify if there were any other issues that they found or whether non x3d processors were also at risk but i would be i would be kind of surprised if they were they've been out there for quite a lot longer at this point and they draw quite a lot more power. So if you're, yeah, if you're running at the same voltages or higher in some cases, and you're drawing more current, I really don't see um, how we wouldn't have noticed this at some point. Um, Steve from Gamers Nexus has apparently acquired Speed Rookie. That's the that's the username of the owner of that CPU. Uh, Speed Rookie CPU and motherboard. So. Maybe there'll be some kind of further insight, but if AMD's got this nailed down and they're not just issuing a, a denial, um, then it seems like it's probably probably solved at this point. I mean, that definitely looks like power got out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not an electronics engineer, so um, Dan's holding his phone like this, Me? which is a oh 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 car key. I see. Hello, wife. Do you want to say hi to the Wan Show? She shrugged. I think that means yes. At least that's how I interpret it late at night, if you know what I mean. <sighs> I mean, what? What? Shrug? It's kind of ascent. Anywho. Bye! Bye! See ya! Um, Riley's adding a discussion question right now. Riley, 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 go home. Work, work day's over. Uh, but asks, has more hardware been failing recently than used to be the norm? Or is this kind of thing more normal than it seems to me? I mean, CPUs failing? Yeah, that's that's Definitely pretty weird. abnormal. Yeah, yeah. Um, hardware in general, I would say probably no, to be honest. But CPUs, yes. Yeah, if anything, I would say the designs for motherboards these days are far more robust than what we used to have in the past oh, with yeah, like dude. electrolytic capacitors and yeah, stuff like that. caps were... That was fun. At least for <laughs> enthusiasts, the emphasis that gets placed on cooling these days by manufacturers, I think that while they're certainly pumping more power through yeah. these things, there's a lot more heat output. Heat, yeah. 
there's a lot more attentiveness to um, to to keeping things cool and maintaining the longevity of these devices. Like as a whole, the industry has learned a lot about the the doodads and gizmos that they're playing around with, right? And if you're a manufacturer, you do not want a failure, at least not within the one to three years that most of them offer a warranty on their products. So, I mean, with that said, I'm not saying that mistakes get, ever get made. I'm not saying mistakes never get made. I mean, you ask someone like a Lewis Rossman about, you know, MacBooks, and he'll tell you all about design flaws for days or whatever. But, you know, overall, I can't say that I've... I can't say that it seems any worse to me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like we said kind of at the beginning, probably not worse overall but it is surprising for it to hit CPUs. CPUs have always kind of been the like rock solid piece of hardware in your computer. Go through multiple boards for one extremely long-term CPU sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like woefully unreliable stuff was way more common back then. Like think about the early 680i motherboards. Remember those? They were awful. They failed all over the place. Everybody knew it. I haven't seen just... A known bad part like that in a long time. Yeah, I feel like we might have we might have had like a few years there where it was abnormally low, and we might be coming back out of that, and that might be why he's feeling it more. But it was definitely like, yeah, it was definitely pretty freaking bad. Yeah, float plane chat. Shout out OCZ. Yeah, yeah I mean their memory modules would just drop dead spontaneously <laughs> yeah. because. RAM used to, like, one of the first things I would check when diagnosing computers was, does it have liquid caps? And then if there's a problem, does it have liquid caps? No? Okay, is the RAM dead? Like, And OCZ would literally create kits of what was called UTT memory, okay, which is short for untested. <laughs> they, would, they would have these UTT memory kits. They would sell them at, at like, these insane speeds and really low latencies, and high voltages and i think they were just playing a numbers game where they they bought this like cheap bargain memory basically went yeah if anything goes wrong with it lifetime warranty we got you and then they just counted on few enough of the buyers actually running those volts through them and in the event that they did few enough of them bothering Falling to rma through. it yeah because uh, you know what realistically what do i really even want a replacement for this or because the technology industry was moving so fast would i rather just upgrade to something else at this point anyway you know what forget it i, I think i think that was the entire basis of their company <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i uh, agility ssds anyone <laughs> oh you know what's funny is so, some of yeah that that model where they just buy all this like trash, sometimes some of it works for a really long time. I was going to say, so I was actually the product manager for OCC at NCIX for a short period of time. And their RAM was fine in those days, other than the very high spec stuff, other than the very high spec DDR2. But that could have easily been down to the memory controllers just not being able to handle it because it was early days of DDR2. And it was rough. <laughs> I don't think we've had a worse transition than the one from DDR1 to DDR2. At least not since then, anyway. Eh, DDR3 is kind of rough. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, uh, their RAM was actually mostly pretty good in those days. And, depending on the batch, the SSDs were actually super reliable. We had this, we, back in the day, yeah. had this green OCZ Agility 3. I just looked it up to make sure that I was right. Yep. And that thing went through... Probably years and years. A ton of junk over a, a lot of years. Except when they had bad batches. Yeah, this, this is what I'm saying. Because like, that's the thing. Is, it was this gamble. Is <laughs> Bad QC is not always a problem. It's not. It doesn't it's, mean bad product. It's only a problem when you don't catch something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So that's this is oh. why. Okay, so we, we used to do these factory tours, um, and we would often get pushback when we would try to show their failures. Because they would yeah. have like, oh, a failure bin or whatever, where like something didn't work out. So yeah. they Sennheiser they yeah. was super mad. They didn't want us to show it was um, failed drivers the for the HD800. Yeah. And we were like, no, like this is a good story because this shows you're not going to ship them. Yes. Oh, man. We had to twist their arms so hard. Like, I don't like profiling, but Germans, okay? <laughs> German perfection. 
there's a sense of, you know, again, this is something I just like, I can't relate to, right? But there's this like cultural sense of pride in, in, in German craftsmanship, right? Um, so they didn't want to show that there could be a flaw. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going, no, 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 no. This is a story about, about like painstakingly um, thorough German quality control. It, it doesn't have to be a story about make it right the first time, every time. Yeah, like we, we were trying to show that it was cool that this happened. We weren't trying to dog on them, but it took it took some convincing. Yeah. I think eventually... They we, did. Yeah. We did end up including that in the video, yeah. and I felt that that was a truly, really important part of the story. Agreed. Uh, because they really did care a lot. They actually... Try, and, I mean, I, I did that video testing out cheap sports tech a little while ago, and <laughs> if you don't match the frequency response of the drivers in each year... It's a noticeable problem in the listening experience. But that's what they were doing was they were finding ones that didn't meet their standard and they were making sure that the drivers were appropriately matched. Really great story. Yeah. 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 Man, that was a hilarious factory. Seeing the German versus the Japanese approach, <laughs> yeah. like almost back to back, cool. right? There was only a few months in between was really eye opening. Because we, we went to Omron afterwards. Yeah. Both sort of both countries and cultures excellence are well respected around the world yeah. for exactly that but they come to this conclusion the same conclusion in such utterly different ways right so i mean man um i forget if it was i, I was it sennheiser or cherry I think it might have been Sennheiser. These were both in Germany. But they had these they had these bulletin boards and I will I will remember this forever till the day I die. First of all, both of them spotless. So clean oh, you could eat was, off of any surface. This was Sennheiser. I remember this too. This was wild. Yeah, okay. Spotless. Like it didn't it didn't look like a factory. It didn't smell like a factory. They were definitely making stuff. You could eat off the floor. You you could eat off any surface. Yes. I swear to you. Yeah. Um anyway, they had these bulletin boards, you know, spaced out you know, very evenly. Um, and they had things <laughs> like, perfectly like safety bulletins, schedules, upcoming events, uh, you know, workplace safety m p notices, all that kind of thing. And then in one corner, I think it was the corner, they had just this arrangement of rectangles. And I, I stopped. I stopped the tour and I said, it, is that to make sure that the way that all the other bulletins are posted is exactly the same on every one. And they're like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so, 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 so interviewing people there and talking to them, uh, not just the business people, we got to talk to engineers as well. There's, um, there's, there's a different philosophy. So when, uh, and it was really interesting looking at both Cherry and Omron because they both make fundamentally the same thing right yeah. so um at cherry there was oh did we talk about how we were also at zf i don't know if we did in the video ah statute of limitations i'm sure they're not going to get mad about it at this point anyway uh the point is we also got to check out some zf stuff even if it didn't make it into the video so uh zf does a lot of work for the automotive industry which is you know, kind of a thing in germany right um and anyway, uh, the but but it's the it's the Cherry MX switch versus it was the Romer G that Omron and Logitech, who actually sponsored the video, was really focused on. And after after talking to everyone and seeing everything that we did, the the bottom line thing that I came away with, you know, the the two sort of different approaches to this same ultimate end goal, the two philosophies, um, was the German attitude was make it perfect, make it once make it last right whereas the japanese approach was make it really good pretty darn good make yeah. it pretty near perfect um and make it twice and make it twice <laughs> and make it last yeah. so the way that the cherry mx switch works right is there's uh there's a contact but there's only one. It's a gold-plated contact, and, and Cherry will talk talk your ear off for a week about you know how they fine-tune the gold you know leaf on the thing and the you know the size of the bump and blah 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 whatever else right. Uh, but in the Romer G, there's actually two. So if one of them fails, the other one still works and the switch operates normally. And I just thought I thought those those two approaches to the design of a reliable switch were so cool, so interesting. 
Um, probably there's no cost benefit one way or the other, making it absolutely perfect every time versus making it mostly perfect, but with redundancy. But it just came down to design philosophy. And I, just, I thought and that can, was super cool. You can cool. see that in a lot of other products, a lot of other companies from those countries as well. It's very interesting. And the Omron factory, also very clean. Oh, yeah. And I would eat off of most surfaces, but not quite all. You know? Like, it was okay if the bulletins were not arranged exactly the same way on every single board. <laughs> that, was, that was okay, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, this is interesting. Um, there's apparently a new, there's, there's leaked pricing for the ROG Ally. Okay. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm totally changing gears here real quick, Dan. I'm sorry. I will get to that. I'll get to that really quick. Um, another leak, the ROG Ally will apparently start at 600 bucks with AMD Z1 and 256 gig SSD. If that's true, then this, then that's just $70 higher than the same storage that's size Steam Deck. so aggressive. For how much more performance you're getting, and more importantly, for how quiet it is, that is awesome. <sighs> like, awesome. The Ally is not a perfect experience, to be very, very, very clear here. What do you say the Steam Deck is, though? No, well, no, but... I, I, but I'm talking about the ally in a different way. I'm just clarifying for people. Sure. Game compatibility is much better. But the experience of playing those compatible games, well, there's some hurdles to overcome still. Asus has a lot of work to do on the software. Interesting. And so does Microsoft. Windows is not optimized for these handheld consoles. And like I just... just I have this, okay, here, actually, I, I recorded this video on my phone conveniently. I was just, I was trying to do something basic. What the heck was I trying to do? I'm honestly having a hard time remembering. But I, I was, oh yeah, right, I remember. I was trying to go into the stupid AMD control panel, and I was trying to alter a setting for the GPU driver. And I had a game running, I had, uh, I was playing Stray, I finally played Stray. Um, I had a game running, and I couldn't. Get it open. It just kept being Windows about it. And yeah, I can't, I can't find it right now. But I, I, kept, I kept, you know, swiping up and then that brings up the little bar and then I'd swipe up again and then I would click the Windows icon and, and then it would go away and I'd be, okay, so I'd swipe up twice again and then I'd go into the system tray and then I'd click the AMD control panel and then the stupid thing would go away. And I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. I'm not even in exclusive full screen mode right now. Like it's... The Steam Deck is a console, and that's its strength. Right now, the Ally is a computer with a controller bolted to it, and that comes with problems. And there's some things that Asus is doing where that they're trying to, um, where they're attempting to mitigate that, but it's a mitigation. Unless Microsoft gets involved, it's not going to be a perfect experience. Now, on the Steam Deck, I'm not saying it's perfect either, but what it is, is it's seamless. For the games that it does play, well, I shouldn't say seamless, it's less seamy. <laughs> For the games that it does play, you can expect that there's been some kind of validation process that has taken place. Someone looked at it at some point. Do you think Valve would have been interested in packaging SteamOS with the Ally? I don't know about the Ally, but my understanding is that they, at some point, talked to at least some of the competing handheld console makers, and they've certainly taken a fairly open approach to the operating system. It's not like, uh, oh, shoot, what's it called? It's escaping me now. But there's uh, there's a third party sort of basically Steam OS, um, Steam OS alternative for desktop. Ugh. I can't, hollow, hollow ISO, that's the one. And it's not like Valve is clamping down on that or anything like that. They've also, I think, I mean, they committed at some point. I don't know if they've actually talked about it lately, but they said they were going to release SteamOS as just a standalone operating system at some point. So at that point, nothing would prevent a third-party handheld maker from installing it and shipping it. Like, it's it's free, right? Yeah. Um, but what I also heard anecdotally is that there are certain things that valve is keeping for themselves like the profiles that they've created where they've tuned the game to run well on the steam deck hardware anyway that price excited 
And now is the time to explain merch messages. Okay, those of you sending super chats, this is the one time I'm going to look at them. Hey, shout out uh, Prono Bozo. Super cool. And uh, thanks, Darcy. All right, we, so we got a couple super chats. There you go. Because the real way to interact with the show is through merch messages. Uh, if you go on lttstore.com and you check out with... Oh, actually, don't check out quite yet. Because we've got a couple of cool deals to announce and some new products, some restocks, all that kind of good stuff. But if you go on lttstore.com and check out, you'll see a little box called Merch Messages. And you fill that out, you check out your order, and you will get your order in the mail, which is great. Which is better than just kind of digital pixels or throwing whatever money into the void yeah throwing money at the screen like you would on twitch or youtube and you might also get a reply from dan your message showing up at the bottom of the screen if you just want to you know say something that means something meaningful to you uh or dan will select a handful of them for me and luke to talk about either now or during uh when show after dark which is sort of the second half of the show um Now's a good time for me to go through and talk about some of the exciting stuff we've got going on on the store this week. Uh, first up is if you... Wait, did Nick get that done? I don't see it in the notes. Um, Dan, the backpack thing? The backpack thing. Do we know? Uh, oh, it should be done? Okay, we've got a pretty cool promotion to celebrate almost... Being ready to ship a solution to the carabiner zipper pull thing. Yes, we are still working on it. We're very, very close, and we have an update to share with you guys very shortly. Luke's actually got them over there. Uh, we are doing a promo where if you buy the backpack... So let's go ahead. I'll see if I can show this to you guys. Should be good to go. Okay. If you buy the backpack, add that to your cart. And a meme pillow, like, say, for example, this one, Sad Linus or Linus Selfie we will give you the meme pillow for free. Woo! There it is. Free pillow with backpack. So it'll it'll automatically apply the discount. You guys can check that out at lttstore.com. Uh, we've also got some restocks. We have new towel colors. And the existing towels are back in stock. So uh, we actually sold out, a, particularly the large ones, extremely quickly last time around. Those are apparently better too. I don't know if it's in the notes, oh. but Nick was talking to me about how uh, they did a new fabric softening thing huh. in production, which makes them absorb more water, dry faster, and something else that I don't remember. I'm sorry, Nick. But yeah, apparently they're better. Go team. We've got two new t-shirt designs. Holy crap. There really is a lot of There's stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on this, this week. This week. Um, the sketchy PC t-shirt, which is sketchy because it's like a sketch. Ha <laughs> ha. Get it? Ha 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 ha. The sketchy PC t-shirt is now available and also what? Northern Lights. You could think of this as kind of like a spiritual successor to the old Constellations shirt. Pretty sick. I've already gotten one compliment on it. It was from my daughter, so I'm not sure if that counts, but uh, I think that that definitely counts. Yeah, she was like, "That's a cool shirt. Is that from your store?" I'm like, "Yeah. Yeah, it is." <laughs> We also brought back... Oh, we brought back the expensive edition CPU pillow. Oh, for crying out loud, you guys. Uh, okay, well, apparently we brought back the expensive edition CPU pillow. So if you want to show that you have more money than cents and your way of doing that is by putting something on your couch, well, there it is. For $169.99, you too can be the proud owner of an expensive edition CPU pillow. Um, really? People who buy this thing are happy with it. <laughs> It feels like a ripoff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what I, that's what I'm talking about. Wait, it feels empty. Okay. Oh, mm, okay. So that's it. Does take a little while to puff up, and it does smell bad out of the box. Um, I'll pack a wool. Yeah. So that's something to be aware of. Like I have ones that I've had deployed on my couch for a long time, and they're very puffy. But if they've been if they've just been like sitting, especially under a pile for a while, they can compress. And I would strongly recommend that you put them out like to air out somewhere for like a week before you like, you know, put bury your face in them and smell them because they come from alpacas. And so they they smell like alpacas <laughs> right, right out of the box. We actually had a very, very low star rating on this product until we updated the description to include this. Please note that due to the 100% alpaca wool fill, there may be a bit of 
an odor to this pillow, especially when you first take it out of the box. Uh, yeah, significant direct sunlight for the first few days. That's that's what we recommend, and that's been fixing problems for most people. <laughs> Uh, Frey says mine only smelled for about two days. Okay, there you go. Where, did you come back every hour? I'm like, see if it still smelled. I'm like, how do you how do you know exactly how many days it smelled for? You know what? It doesn't matter. The point is, the last thing that I want to update you guys on is this. We are apparently doing a onesie. This is Bridget's project, her pet project. I take no responsibility oh. for this. I approved. Moving forward with production on one print. Not two, one. Okay, so this is the same prism design from the women's underwear. So if you want to see a bit of a higher quality image, you can just go on the store and check out any of the women's underwear products. Um, and this is the confetti design also from the women's underwear. Uh, you can get a better picture of it there. And we want to know, Luke, can you create a poll? Prism sure. versus confetti. Let us know what you guys want to see. Yeah, float plane chat's already like, I am so down for this. Um, yeah. Okay. No, do both. No. No, there's no feet. No. There's no feet. I I am just wearing socks. It's just a just a an, a, an elastic elastic uh, ankle. All right. So we'll get a we'll get a pull up for that. And. Sorry, Nick didn't even want me to do all this stuff today, but I was like, no, it's okay. We'll, we'll give more store updates. Uh, Luke, Luke, what? carabiner update. Oh. Let's do it. Hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. Okay. Luke is going to be our test monkey. You're going to space today, Luke. Yes. Let's help you make it back <laughs> I've safe. I've been waiting for so long. <laughs> okay. Um, so am, am I going through the whole process? Dan, don't, don't move around too much. Just yell at Luke and tell him to go to the right place. Okay. All right, let me know when you're ready. He's Let's working see. on it. Okay, the poll is working. Most okay. people are going for confetti so far, but it is pretty close. Okay. It's 41 to 59% so far. All right, we ready? He's, he's working on it. The, the tripod's locked and the cameras are hard. We good? And again, am I going through the whole process? Okay, Luke cam, here we go. Okay, so aim a little bit to Luke's side. Nope, nope, you want the table, table. There you go. Yep, there we go. There we go. All right. I do want you to do it on the so table. So, Luke, you get no instructions. You get the defective carabiner. So, do you want to show the design flaw real quick? Okay. No, Wait. no, no. Stop doing that. No, Dan, don't follow him. Okay. <laughs> You're going to give people motion sickness, you guys. Okay, so this is the old zipper. Yep, okay. And the design flaw is there's, there's like, no rail on it, and this is a hard pin down here. So, if you press on the side, it would break. Yeah. You want me to break it? I mean... I don't feel like I need to break it. You can if you really want to. I, I think it's pretty easy to understand. This one has a just flaw. Just break it. Okay. Some, of them, some of them are better than others, but if you push hard enough, you can break it. It took a bit of force. Like, I had to yeah. kind of send it. But Most people, they haven't failed. Mine haven't failed. But some were pr had particularly thin walls and failed very easily. So, yeah. so it was clear that we needed to recall this. It also could come down to, like, how you actually pull on the yes. zipper and stuff like that. Like, I think the way that I pull on the zipper, which is I grab this... Yeah, part I grab this part. It's not going to fail for me because I don't apply any pressure to the actual arm. But, but we're still going to fix the problem, and we're going to fix it for everyone. So the kit that everyone will receive. Uh, what are you doing right now? I don't know, I'm messing around. Oh, okay. Uh, can you show the parts that will be included in the kit? So first okay, so of all, no, stop lifting it up. <laughs> it's a little hard to see. Yep. But you are going to get this little arm that has kind of like a, a wider flat edge and a thinner flat edge yep. that is for prying open the the clasp on the zipper that you currently have. And then last time we showed this off, we had these like clamps that you had to squeeze this yeah, way. Yeah, that was not the real solution. No. But so now this is the closing mechanism. Get get to that later. We're going to show them how it works later. Okay. So first, remove the remove the defective pull. So that's with the yep. I'm not giving you any instructions. So just do your best. Oh, you already removed it. Yeah, I was well, just kind of fiddling around. Luke, okay. you're supposed to be doing a <laughs> okay. demo for crying so out loud. You, you, take, <laughs> you take this brass looking thing, but it's probably not brass, um, and put it in the zipper, and then you just turn it to the side. It's okay. It's very easy. Well, t turn it then. Show them. Show the people. You have to show the people, Luke. You put it in. Jeez. And you turn it to the side. Great. Okay. And, and it lifts done. it up just enough that you can get a new one in. 
No, because stop. Oh, I was trying to find it for myself. <laughs> uh, so this, the circle right here, you can see it's very thin on this edge. Yes. That is very easy to get under it once you've pried it open just a little bit. You don't have to send it to the moon because uh, you might actually break the, the, I don't know what this part not is called. might, you will. You will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not designed to be open and closed a bunch of times. No. It's also not designed to be open super wide. It's designed so to be to closed once. But what we found is you can probably get away with anywhere from three to four before they will definitely fail. But you should only ever really do one, because we're going to send you... This. These awesome new zippers right here, which okay. are great. They're going to be probably a little bit smaller, uh, just because okay. I found that with them that tall... They're pretty big. Yeah, they kind of were cumbersome. It could definitely be smaller. We're gonna... And then these ones are much better at dealing with side-to-side -side force. So they're a single titanium piece, and they've just got like this little... Um... It's hard to see, but there's like slots in it here, yeah. which allow it to bend. Yeah. If and it's still not like, if you if you really... Oh, you could try and break it, and you can break it. Yes, of course but you'd you have to really crank it. Like, you'd have to be trying to do damage to it. Yeah, it's so. not going to happen by accident, just pulling no. on the zipper, which is what it's intended for. Okay, so go ahead and try to install it. Step one, yes. So I haven't Open the actually zipper. done this. But Good, that's the whole point. Da, 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 da. I'm, just, I'm trying to see. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the new zipper. I'm going to put it in the thingy-majiggy that I just opened. Got it. This is hilarious. Audio Gary in uh, Float Plane Chat is like, can I just buy the zipper changing kit? I have some busted up zippers that this would be lovely for. So now this thing, I, the only way to really get at it, especially when it's in a bag, on a bag, whatever, is going to be to go inside the zipper. Yep. So there's a little garage. And I'm going to move that out of the way. I'm very proud that I, I actually did contribute to the final design for this. Part um, of the uh, whole requirement is that while you do this, you pull a beard hair out with the microphone that's in front of you. Uh, <laughs> so what? Okay, I've got that in position now. That's pretty easy. You just kind of move it on, yep, and then little, it's done. Little garage. And there. And then I'm assuming you just turn this until you can't, because that would be good design. And I feel like I'm probably done. Okay. Well, let's okay, find I'm out. I mean, loosen it back and then pull it off. Look. The idea here, guys, is that we are we are testing this. We're testing this with a real user with no instructions like real users will tend to... Dang it, Luke. Okay, it's fine. We're good. Okay, sorry. Okay. I'll, do, I'll do it on the flat surface. So, blah, blah, blah. There you go. Okay, try and get it out. Try and, try and get it out of the gap where the people can see. <laughs> yeah, that's not coming out. Again, that's a situation like I'm putting enough force okay. on this where Thanks, I'd Dan. have to be trying to damage it in order to do that. Um, okay. Now, you guys are probably Pretty wondering, easy. well, why aren't you just done yet then? The answer is that we still have a couple of things to fine tune. Uh, did Tynan provide any of the, uh, the re-tighteners that broke? No, no, I don't think so. Okay, well, we, we managed to break a couple of them in the retightening process. Also, as you can probably imagine, these are 3D printed. Yeah. And if we're going to be manufacturing, um, let's see. Quite nicely to whoever did this or 40, whatever. 40,000 of them. Uh, they're not going to be 3D printed. That would be stupid. Uh, they're going to be injection molded. Uh, yeah, that's our fancy new printer. It's really cool. It's nice. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, we're, we're not doing 40,000 parts in it, tell you that much. Uh, it's quite a bit more expensive. Um, so we need to get molds done. We need to get 40,000 parts manufactured, right? Like yeah. making one of anything takes some time. Making a thousand of something takes more time. And then there's also all the zippers. One kit, but tons of poles. Yeah, so we also have to manufacture like 160,000 zippers, right? Well, yeah, like that's the thing, right? Is that I remember, I remember giving the team a hard time. I was like, hey, we're out of stock of bits. Because uh, some some of the bit sets for the screwdriver are out of stock. I'm like, well, like, can we get more? We got to get them quickly. And they're like, well, here's the thing, boss. How do you get that many so quickly? Each pack is however many times however many packs. You're asking me to order like a million bits. They only have so many machines, boss. <laughs> And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, someone in full plane chat said, break it, show what it takes. I, I don't want to do that because I don't know how many of these they have. I have seen Tynan take this to... Okay. Just do it. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me just switch to the loot cam and you can just hold it up where we can see what you're doing. Next to my face. Okay, Dan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Unbelievable. Oh, he was making kissing noises. <laughs> okay, so yeah. one little thing is I, I torqued it pretty far already, and now the resting position, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's slightly to the side. But with how it's made, I could just do that, and yep, now it's perfect again. Because I can just bend it back the other way. Um, we're not recommending that, just to be very clear. We're not saying do that over and over again. That would be really stupid. Oh, Any metal is going to it's eventually... It's at a 90 degree now. ...is going to eventually break from fatigue. And then I'm going to try to, like, put it back. Oh, lordy. This is very painful. There it goes. Okay. That took a lot of effort. That okay. would never happen under a normal use case. Never say never, but probably not. Yeah. Nothing everything can break. Yeah, everything yes. can break. I, someone's going to break one of these. Can I have one? Yeah, yeah, ideally not the one you broke. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like, yeah, here, you want a sandwich? I digested this one already. <laughs> <laughs> it's got all the components of a sandwich. I mean. <laughs> and some other stuff. Some of them were used. I'll <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, break the water bottle. Yeah, like we can... Uh, the ability to break something does not mean that it is poorly designed or weak. Yeah. Um, and like it can be, it can be because of the way that it's structured, it could be bent this way. Yeah. Pretty much an unlimited number of times. Yeah. Nothing is unlimited. Nothing is perfect. Yeah. But this way. And it, yeah, you could break. I that got it eventually. slightly past 90. Like the use case where that's going to happen is crazy. You I would have to get caught on something. You would have to do something very bad to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. In which case, like, yeah, it's just going to be a problem. Like, it takes it takes some effort. Yeah. Sure, you can break it if you drag the metal beyond 90 degrees. Yep. Like, I don't know. All right. I'm excited. It's going to take some time. We've got a lot of stuff to manufacture, but... Man, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, When we figured out that we were going to have to deal with that, to be clear, there was never any question of whether we were going to deal with it or not. Trust me, bro. But the question of how and at what cost, <laughs> obviously, they, those need to be answered. Yeah. Um, the cost is very high. Well, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of titanium. And they're nice. It's four pulls per bag. Duh. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That's wow. okay. That's what profit margins are for, right? That... that no, profit margins are for profit. Oh, if what, you must, the... if you must consume them with a product recall, then you do it. <laughs> but that's not what they're for. But you need to have some of it just in case. They're for happens. building labs. Yeah, <laughs> hiring people. <laughs> so many new people lately. All right, well that's. I have some it. bad news about that, by the way, what? which we can talk about after the show. Ugh. Yep. All so. right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, hit me. Okay, first up today is from Robert. Linus, what do you think are the biggest advantages and disadvantages of ADHD? If you need help, I forgot what it was. I was going to ask why I was buying this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so, I mean, I, I think it's pretty well documented. Uh, you know, hyper focus slash, like, you know, dragon energy creativity is, I would say, the biggest benefits for me. Um, the biggest drawback is if I. I'm not interested in something, I basically cannot force myself to do it. Um, and that has all kinds of negative implications in life, you know, whether it's flunking out of school, uh, whether it's, you know, difficulty um, fostering relationships because you just ain't interested in what that person's talking about and no amount of, of trying to make yourself focus on it will make you retain any of it. <laughs> like I just... I, 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 I think my best, my best survival, um, my best survival strat has been to just surround myself with people that I am interested in so that I don't have to deal with that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm going to make my own company where everyone is someone that I would want to talk to, because if there's someone I don't want to talk to, I'm simply not able to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I mean... And everyone, every, everyone's a little bit different. You know, I think just trying to apply one label to everybody when we're all such complicated creatures full of, you know, chemicals and electrical impulses and all kinds of fun things is... Brain is, drugs. Yeah, is, is very challenging, right? Um, but for me, anyway, that's, that's my experience. 
Okay. Uh, Hit me next. with another. Here comes another. Next one's from George. How has your approach to content creation changed over the years? And what strategies do you use to keep your audience engaged and interested in your videos? Did you pick related questions on purpose? I try and create a theme. Because but... basically, um, my approach changes when I get bored. And my boredom happens a lot faster than yours because I have ADHD. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's the idea, right? And it's actually helped a lot. Yeah, I, like I, I, I remember there was this this outcry from the audience when we stopped doing power supply unboxings, right? What? You're not going to do power supply unboxings anymore? And the same thing happened when we stopped doing motherboard, uh, motherboard unboxings. unboxings and all these different categories that we covered at some point and then basically just went, eh, I'm bored, and stopped doing. And even though you know uh, a significant portion of the audience was upset about it, the channel never did anything but grow at those points because even if they didn't realize it, they were going to get bored. It was going to happen and something had to change. And I knew that at that time, we weren't set up to change the way that we approached covering those products. Um, you know, we didn't have the funding or the, uh, the knowledge or the experience to do you know, detailed power supply testing, for example. So that wasn't going to happen. So the better thing for us to do was to go find something that did excite us and go do that instead. And it worked. We also do listen to the audience. You can't just ignore the audience and just do whatever whim strikes you. That's not going to be a good content creation strategy either. So figuring out how to separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to audience feedback and then trusting your instincts as well. I mean, don't imagine that we're never going to return to those categories. That's the entire point of the lab. Like we've got, I don't, I don't even remember how much that power supply tester from Chroma cost us, but I believe it's fully set up now, like actually like physically set up. And I believe they're coming for training, like in a matter of days or weeks. It's not months. And, oh, you want to know something really cool? The RF chamber, two days into its 10-day construction right now. Oh, cool. Yeah, the techs are here building it nice. right now. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited. RF chamber is going to be great because, man, covering stuff like wireless router how do you how, how do you do it right like obviously you know i tried to find ways back in the day like i in in my old house for example i would put them in the same place every time and i had like a handful of places that i would check and then i'd be like okay yeah the signal strength and transmission data rate are you know x and x minus y and x plus y or x plus z or whatever for all these different products and it's like it's something, but it's it's not scientific. It's not repeatable, right? So the RF chamber is going to change all of that. Very, very excited. And not just wireless routers. Like we're talking cell phones. We're going to have our own like 4G, 5G network thing. It's going to be awesome. Like who, which phone has the best reception? Literally nobody covers that. They're phones, ostensibly. And yet we don't talk about the fact that my phone, I can't carry on a conversation even though i'm on the same network as my wife and she can i feel like this used to be a thing like it was a decade or more ago it totally was and now it's not really covered at all yeah, yeah. drives me crazy it's annoying i want to know why i can hear luke's phone on the mics and i can't hear linus's or mine right that would, that would be actually amazing. be pretty interesting we should test like my stupid I've, phone i've, I've yeah. always wanted to know that, <laughs> that would yeah. be interesting i'm super into it okay let's do some rapid fire now actually be rapid fire okay what's our time limit do you have know. a timer uh 40 minutes ago let's go i i told dan he's supposed to have a timer for rapid fire but he has adhd so he didn't do it i forgot <laughs> <laughs> I, we can use the pain timer here we go my daughter is a big fan she wanted to ask linus is excited for the new legend of zelda tears of the kingdom have you seen the demo footage vehicle building looks insane <sighs> It was a two-second sigh. I'm, Come on. I hate giving Nintendo money, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's the only way I can get you a timer. This is going to be really confusing. All right, people. let's get rid of that then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched any of the demos for the same reason that I don't watch trailers of movies I know I'm going to watch. I'm going to play it. Um, with that said, I, I felt... You know when you finish a game or a book or a movie and you're like, 
That's <sighs> good. It ended at the right time. It's done. Yeah. When I beat Ganondorf at the end of Breath of the Wild, I wasn't one of those people who has gone back over the last three or four years and and, and played it more. Like I I I loaded up um I loaded it up recently because I wanted to try it on the ROG Ally with uh CMU and just kind of see what the performance was like. Amazing. Um <laughs> Like so much better than the Switch. <laughs> anyway, I so I fired it up, and even in the in the beginning areas of the game, like I I couldn't fight anything. I just, like almost died, just like fighting stupid basic bacoblins or whatever they're called. And I'm sitting here going, oh crap! When Tears of the Kingdom comes out, I'm gonna have to learn this be all terrible. over again. I'm gonna yeah. suck. Yeah. Whereas like I had no problem farming like the top tier equipment from whatever those like horsey centaur guys are or whatever. Like that, I, I was I was like good. Like I beat the game or whatever um oh. anyway i hate giving nintendo money i'm gonna do it anyway but i'm gonna give them my money and then i'm gonna play it on my uh, <coughs> ally if i can i just I, just, I hate that my save data is stuck on the stupid switch oh yeah for sure i want something i can it's back like up. actually dangerous yeah yeah it's ridiculous Okay, next up. With the prices of NVIDIA's 4000 series, do you think their 5000 series will be even more expensive? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you're getting better at this. Atlas OS sounds like a perfect solution to bloatware on new setups, but how would you work around potential software or data loss using it on a machine that has existing software? I'm so glad you brought up Atlas OS because there's been some outcry in the community yeah. over our promotion of the project. So first of all, I just want to say we did include a list not exhaustive, but it did include most of the major concerns from people in the community of potential downsides to Atlas OS, including the fact that it disables UAC, uh, disables Windows Defender, um, it uh, handicaps uh, Windows Update. So there are, there are definitely issues with Atlas OS the way that it is. The main point that we wanted to feature it was we wanted to demonstrate what an unbloated Windows can look like and the Atlas OS devs are well enough aware of the issues and they're actually working on them, which is, which is really, really exciting. So it's, it's great that people are giving their feedback about those concerns and it's great that the Atlas devs are taking the whole thing seriously. Um, I saw a lot of people making really weird suggestions like you shouldn't use Atlas OS, it's sketchy, you should use a debloater. Atlas OS is a debloater, um, it's open source. That's not to say that it's perfect in its current iteration. There's definitely stuff that they need to work on in order to make it safer to daily drive for regular users. As it is right now, you should only use it if you 100% know what you're doing and if you are running a third-party antivirus, if there's any risk whatsoever of you doing something, whoops, which, you know, frankly, with how sophisticated cyber attacks are these days, is a non-zero chance for anyone, like even you. Something could happen, right? Yep. Okay, next up. I think I think sorry, oh. I just want yeah, if, go for if it. you're if you're wanting to set it up like like imagine the uh the racing sim up there. Like say it was one of those types of computers, all you ever do is like update the game through Steam. You don't browse ever, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like maybe you can get by with it, but it's not a good idea to run completely antivirus lists. Sorry, keep going. But I think I made the mistake in that video of just kind of brushing it over brushing over it a little bit too. Well, more, I didn't actually watch it. <laughs> more assuming that I was talking to my audience instead of accounting for that a lot of people who watch our videos are not like dialed in. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're not watching every day. They're not advanced users necessarily. And I think that was a little irresponsible. Um, on that subject, actually, there's there's another thing that I was probably a little irresponsible about and is is worth addressing at this point. Uh, we talked about Nebula a couple of weeks ago and their CEO posted in their subreddit uh, that I got basically everything wrong, which is one way of, of saying it. Um, there are a couple of things that I miscommunicated and there are a couple of things that I misunderstand and that I misunderstood. Um, and I think most of it is just due to the fact that I had outdated information, which I really should have I should have accounted for. Um, I also did a really poor job of explaining when I said that a subscription, out of a subscription, very little of that money would go to the individual creator. And what I meant was that if I, a creator, sold a subscription to Nebula to my audience, I would get very little of that over the lifetime of that subscriber. That's not to say that I get very little money. 
That's to say that it's a completely different model. I don't know how their thing works. If if someone subscribed and then only watched your content, it, like is it is it divided based on what content they watch? Uh, theoretically, it's based on it's based on watch time. So if someone only watched the person they subscribed to and nobody else ever, that I don't know. Yeah, that I don't know, but. Based on that, it's an all-you-can-eat platform where you subscribe to the entire library. Yeah, stuff. you'll probably yeah. watch other stuff. Um, uh, see, I don't. Uh, my goal isn't to out anyone or anything here either. But the way that I, the way that I approached that, saying that you know, it seemed like people were more into the part ownership, which is a really good thing, by the way. The fact that the creators are part owners in the platform. But the way that I approached that saying like, okay, well, they're doing this thing where they have these lifetime subscriptions. It seems like they're trying to boost subscriber count. Maybe it's an exit strategy or whatever else. The reason I said that was not because I didn't think the platform was profitable. It's been pretty clear that they're profitable for a long time. Uh, Dave posted on Twitter like a month ago, I think, that they're spending half a million dollars on YouTube advertising a month or something like that. So for me, it was not a question of are they profitable? It was a question of, what's the end what what's the what's the purpose of this here right like why do you need a quarter million dollars in funds if you're spending half a million dollars a month on on advertising through youtube or whatever the case may be so the other thing too is that you know as far as as far as i could tell and again this is outdated conversations right it's like a year ago um with people that i've talked to that have left the platform no it wasn't generating a significant amount of money for them so I don't know. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's definitely things that I missed. Uh, Dave made it very clear that they're not heading towards an exit. So I'm still confused about the lifetime membership. Um, but sure. Um, and I think that's everything that I wanted to clarify. I had a lot of people comment uh, to me directly, actually, that they, you know, thought it was weird that I was commenting on a competitor. And uh, Dave has said publicly already, and I've said before, I, I don't see them as a competitor. They're not in the same space. They it's have a very different model. They have video on their website, but that's about where the similarities end. Um, I, I think you could say that we're more of a Patreon competitor if you would even, if we weren't an ant that Patreon would squish <laughs> under their heel, right? Like we're... We just kind of do our own thing. Float planes, float plane, man. It maybe it'll take off someday, and if it doesn't, hey, it ain't gonna sink. That's literally what the branding means, and it's been a massive success for us internally. Like it's we don't hide the numbers, right? We've got over forty-two thousand monthly subscribers on Floatplane right now. It's it's a really it's actually been a really exciting last few months for Floatplane. And we passed the one month anniversary of the hack, so that's yeah. people that stayed around. Well, yeah, it's, there's really good content. Yeah. We actually saw no real noticeable dip on the anniversary of the hack. Um, and like many of the creators that... Um, you know what? I think I've said enough. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty much all I have to... That's pretty much all I have to say about it. Uh, our model works for us. Their model works for them. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. And I'm glad they're not heading for an exit. Because something that I've always said is it's been nice having them in the space because while I don't see them as a competitor, the landscape of, hey, you can support us outside of main platform that we are on, whether that's YouTube or Instagram or Twitch or whatever else, growing that at all is cool because it legitimizes that space. How different companies decide to approach that in like Nebula's model or Floatplane's model or Patreon's model or whoever else's model, um, they can be ever more different from each other. Um, and I think Floatplane and Nebula are quite different, but it's just nice having more people in that space because it, it normalizes it, which is good. Yeah. <clears throat> Moving on. Okay. Oh man, what do you want to talk to now? Uh, Let's talk about the Mountain to Dead Chromebooks. Yeah. I think this is interesting. I think you're being a hater right now. <sighs> so I'm going to make be. you read the topic. You read All right, the topic. Sounds good. Schools yeah. struggle with mountains of dead Chromebooks. During mountains. the pandemic, American schools 
bought a massive number of Chromebooks. Massive. According to a recent report, those schools now have a massive number of unusable massive. devices. Unusable. <laughs> I'm your hype man. In part because of the obvious cheapness of the materials, but also because the devices are hitting the end of their security updates. Officially, Chromebooks get five to eight years of updates. Five to eight years. But their auto expiration date is determined by when the device was certified, not when it was sold. <sighs> Google tells users to expect an average of four years four of years at time of sale. After Chromebooks pass that expiration date, they can no longer access secure websites, including state testing sites. Okay. <sighs> Pointless changes to basic parts between different models make the Chromebooks difficult to repair. For example, six different manufacturers of the Chromebook 11 made cosmetic changes to the plastic bezel that made parts incompatible between models. Luckily, or not, many schools have large stockpiles of busted Chromebooks to salvage parts from, but salvage is inefficient by design. Yeah. Usually, if a Chromebook has a single broken key, the entire keyboard needs to be replaced. One school official reported that a typical repair involves replacing half the device. Yeah. There was an interesting anecdote from Wednesday's TechLinked episode where Gideon Fraser commented, Fun fact, after having worked as a hardware tech guy in a Georgia school, I can go ahead and tell you that these Chromebooks are actually closer to 90 US dollars a piece, and these kids obliterate them. <laughs> if a key is bad, you can go to the back room filled to the brim with broken Chromebooks, look for one with a functional keyboard and part match, Actually, you do that with every fixable component on these god-awful machines. <laughs> we don't really buy any part re parts replacements because we already have enough broken ones that we should have any part we would need that would actually be viable to fix. Whew. And then uh, another person responded as well. As a fellow tech in Texas, I can confirm those damn screens are just constantly coming in shattered. <laughs> This just in, kids not careful with their things, yeah. especially when they aren't their things. Yeah. More at 11. Yeah. Um, I don't think them breaking often would be different if it was a Chromebook or not. I actually don't either. I think that yeah. kids would be very likely to break school-owned laptops regardless Dude. of whether they were Chromebooks or MacBooks or Windows books or I whatever. I used to get so enraged at how people would treat the computers in the like the lab that you labs. and your friends built yeah like but even the ones that we didn't because like we had such a low budget that like if you break the optical drive on this thing we don't get another one and people would be shoving like garbage they would take like yeah. candy wrappers and put in the optical drive and sh shove it closed like i used to have a little tool i would walk around with to be able to do the manual pop out of optical yeah. drives so i could pull them open and take trash out like it's so annoying. Like, don't like if you don't destroy everything, more of the budget can go towards making this place nice. Yeah. I, can we stop? Like, uh, man, it used to be so frustrating. So I'm not surprised that people would. It's not surprised that people would trash these. So this is going to happen with whatever. And I don't believe most laptop keyboards that I know of have like user user repairable individual keys. I mean, so like a lot of these complaints, I'm I'm coming down on like, I don't know if I can rag on the Chromebook for this. No, it's not Chromebook specific. But what is very frustrating is the fact that these devices will expire that, yes. on average in four years. Yeah. I mean, I just bought a Chromebook for my uh, middle child because uh, she needs it for school next year. And I'm sitting here going, oh, well, I didn't think to check if it was certified... <laughs> like yesterday or a year ago or two years ago or four years ago. It's modern hardware, so probably it was certified fairly recently, but I didn't think to check that. And I can see how that would be exactly the sort of thing that whether it's yes. a parent or whether it's a buyer for a school district or whatever else, there's so many other factors to consider other than when the device was certified that honestly, I, I just, I straight up think that this should just be illegal. And laptops are better now. There were like when I was kind of late high school yeah. it was general wisdom that if you bought a laptop it lasted three years yeah within three years it was going to be crap anyway that's not but really a thing anymore. that's not true you could buy a thinkpad that's 10 years old on yeah. like ebay you know like that's core this second gen core third gen core 
I mean, oh, I mean, man, fourth gen core is almost 10 years old at this point. And that'll be very usable today. As long as you can make sure that you get proper security on it, you update yes. the heck out of it. And then you're just like browsing the internet. That's fine. Who cares? So what is our justification for allowing this stuff to just expire this way? And back to the part that I think should actually be illegal. Why are we allowing companies to continue selling these products well into their lifespan, knowing that what the customer is buying today is a significantly shorter shelf life than what they bought at the beginning of the product cycle? You should cycle? have to, well, you shouldn't really be able to do it at all, but you should have to communicate like this device has... 800 days left until it is garbage when you buy the thing. It's, well, if you're going to hard lock it like that, I mean, if it's going to be a degraded experience, okay, fine. You know, like Apple doesn't roll out new Mac OS updates for their Macs forever. Yeah. At some point, you do have to deprecate the hardware. That, that, that actually is fine. You can't, it's, it would be enormously burdensome for so, them to have to support it forever. It's not what I'm asking for. Someone in float plane chat, uh, Mike D78 said, I'm watching this show on a fourth gen i5 ThinkPad. Works fine. Exactly, right? Yeah. And and so what I'm what I'm saying is knowing that, assuming the kids don't beat the crap out of it, the hardware could still be good in more than four years or even more than five or eight years. It should be communicated. And this is something that I will often tell people when they're shopping for a phone. When people ask me for advice for a phone, I almost never give an exact model because then it's my problem if they don't like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But what I will do is I'll give them some tech tips. And one of the ones that I will really, really try to emphasize is, hey, you need to think about it in terms of total cost of ownership. And I know that that's more of a business the way of considering things. But in our personal lives, it's very applicable. If you buy a brand new iPhone today, right? You can buy a brand new iPhone from the last generation. It's cheaper, right? It's also not as good, but a big part of the reason it's cheaper is not the hardware. It's the support. So if the difference in price between, a, let's just use arbitrary numbers, between a $1,000 iPhone and an $800 iPhone okay, is one fifth, but that $1,000 one is going to last for five years and that $800 one is going to stop getting support in four years. Guess what? They're the same. Are you wanting me to say it? Sure. Cost of ownership, total cost of ownership. Exactly. Now that's not always true, right? It depends what kind of user you are. Are you the type of person that uses your devices into the ground? Well, okay, then... What I just said is very applicable. But if you're the kind of person who's going to upgrade in two years or three years anyway, then it becomes more of a question of, well, are the features important to you? Uh, as opposed to just the, the total cost you're going to pay per year of owning the device, right? Because then all of a sudden, they're the same um, in terms of their software expiry. So you, so you start to move on to other factors. But it's, it's a really important thing to consider, especially with Android phones. Buying a year-old Android phone, particularly a few years ago when they weren't getting support the same way that, I mean, Samsung does what, four years now, I think, three? Oh, oh yeah. If, if you don't mind looking that up, it would be that would be good to know. Uh, but there was a while there where, you know, you were getting one, two, very rarely three major Android updates on your Android four phone. Four years. Four years. Yeah. So they do four years now, at least. Um but it wasn't always that way, and not all vendors have that level of commitment. And so if you're buying it a year into the cycle, don't be fooled. If it's 20% off, that ain't a deal. You're just, you're just buying old hardware at full price, right? For how long you're going to be able to use it. So uh, latest pixels are apparently five years now, which is, which is really great. And yeah, that's, it's, it's a major factor that you should consider. Uh, we're supposed to do sponsors now. Thanks, Dan. The show is brought to you today by MSI. Introducing the MSI MPG A850G PCIe 5.0 Modular Gaming Power Supply. Really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a great power supply for the ultimate gaming experience with support for GeForce 40 Series graphics cards. It can deliver the power and performance needed for the latest games and graphics-heavy applications. Its full modular design and compact size will help keep your PC clean and organized, and its 80-plus gold certification means high efficiency with minimal heat generation. 
It features 100% Japanese 105 degree Celsius capacitors and industrial level protection against power surges and other hazards, meaning the MPG A850G is built to last. So upgrade your gaming PC today with the MPG A850G PCIe 5.0 AE Plus Gold Full Modular Gaming PSU. They really do have a way with words, MSI, don't they? (laughs) The show is also brought to you by Vessi. Oh, what's up, Dan? He needs a second. Here, here's a wild Dan needs a second. This is what Dan needing a second looks like. It's been more than one second, Dan. You'll see as the as the operator of the show ponders over what steps he must take next in order for the sponsor section to continue. The Dan doesn't look like he's doing anything, but he's go. thinking. <laughs> there we go. Having found Riley's crotch, we can continue. There it is. I can see it now. Okay, let's try this again. Number two. Wetness is not something that everyone enjoys, uh, especially... Yeah, we're having problems with the videos here. I see. Okay, go for it. Wetness is not something everyone enjoys, especially when it happens on your feet. But thankfully, we have a secret weapon. Vessi. They claim their shoes are 100% waterproof thanks to their Dymatex technology. Are we really just going to look at this image the whole time? Yeah, you just get to stare at his crotch. Even the most Vessi. Tor- torrential downpours don't stand a chance. If you're not stylish, like me, you need Vessies. Hey, ouch. Uh, their fashion-forward design is perfect for any occasion. They're stretchy and comfortable, and putting on a pair of Vessies is a breeze. They're also easy to get off. And thanks to their sock-like fit, you'll feel like you're walking on a cloud. So go treat your feet. Head to Vessi.com slash WANSHOW to get 15% off your purchase with code WANSHOW. Um, do you need a minute? Should I do the other sponsor? Oh, wow. Oh. Wow, what am I looking at? Okay, cool. Um... Um, we're going to look at that for the, okay. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, AkiFlow. Are you tired of juggling tasks from different apps? AkiFlow's universal inbox let you, lets you take all your tasks from multiple platforms, like Gmail and Trello, and gather them onto one calendar so you can efficiently plan your day or week. AkiFlow aims to solve that ever-so-common problem with time-blocking platforms, uh, with a time blocking platform to keep you organized and on track. That's actually super cool being able to just consolidate all this stuff because sometimes you can't control, you know, if someone sends you a Teams invite and someone else sends you a Google Calendar invite and all that kind of stuff. It's super easy to set up. Just head over to their website, log in, connect your existing accounts, and start time blocking your days. Block out your time, not your mind. Go to acuflow.com slash WAN and sign up for a seven day trial for free. Well, that went really smoothly. Brand new sponsor. Hey, good job, everyone. No, it's okay. We got this. We got this. Dan, does your phone have a bird chirping ringtone? Uh, no. Uh, I think that's the bird chirping. Okay. I've been I wondering if I have uh, been... He's I've been hearing outside. them. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. What, I'll deal with it, Luke. I said I would uh, deal with it. <laughs> we don't want you to deal with it that way. <laughs> I just thought I was genuinely concerned. I was like hallucinating. <laughs> No, I thought the same thing. I thought it was one of you guys because it's like really quiet next to my head and coming out of my microphone. But yeah, it's it's, uh, okay. We're all going insane. As long as I'm not going insane, we can continue. Carbon monoxide filter (sighs) alarms getting really irritating. There's somebody, there's somebody on YouTube sending 55 Canadian dollar super chats over and over again. You just can't even. And I can't even see them to read them. Don't send super chats. Buy stuff on the store. We like try to check them, but just don't do it. And if you don't want to buy stuff, just buy gift cards and never use them. Yeah. If you must, just throw money at us. It's like the world's worst bank. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You can only withdraw them in the form of... Products. Of high quality apparel. Um, I mean, that's not that bad, actually. But you get no interest. (laughs) Yeah. Except the interest you'll get from wearing Whoa! our high quality apparel. Hey, you like that setup? <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty good. <laughs> oh, one of our topics today was response to the Atlas OS video. I guess I kind of yeah, jumped I think, in. And, I think we're done that one. Yeah, I think we're good on that one. Um, big accounts forcibly re-verified on... Do we want to even talk about it? I didn't sure. say the name yet. All right, you do we it. You can skip it. Oh, great. We're talking about it. We're talking about it. A bunch of big accounts are forcibly re-verified on the Twitter, Including the at Linus Tech account. Yep. And when we say forcibly, like, oh man, the, the narratives that people are creating in their own heads about this, like that celebrities were outraged that they don't get to feel special because of their verification check marks, or that they're just... I don't know that that this is 
Uh, that this matters. It's Twitter. I don't care. Yeah, okay, carry on. <laughs> for, for no stated reason, Twitter has ha been haphazardly re-verifying certain, haphazardly, yeah, uh, certain prominent accounts without the consent of the account holder. Well, okay, I want to jump in and say the reason that matters is, is because, because of what the badge says. Of what the badge says. The way that it's worded makes it sound like you're a paying Twitter Blue subscriber. It's, it, it says you are. Like, yes. Quite specifically, yeah. These check marks still say that the oh, there it is. Still says that the account is subscribed to Twitter Blue, which seems unlikely in the case of figures like Kobe Bryant, Anthony Bourdain, Jamal Khashoggi, Khashoggi uh, a journalist who was murdered five years ago. So, yeah, I mean that makes sense. Uh, sometimes accounts of people who have passed will be managed by a, a team and stuff like that, but. Yeah. Probably not that one. Probably not. Uh, some of the verifications appear to have been given out of spite. Prominent Twitter comedian at Drill, who has advocated blocking accounts subscribed to Twitter Blue, was given a blue check mark several times as he kept changing his profile name to get rid of it. I actually don't subscribe to the conspiracy theory, um, or the well, the 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 the, the tinfoil hat theory about this. I I I, I well, okay. Oh, I was about to say, I don't think Twitter management is actually petty enough to go find individual users and keep re-verifying them. I don't actually know that for sure, but my understanding is it's basically anyone with over a million followers that's just getting... It's just happening automatically. It's just getting re-verified. It just seemed like a bug to me. I don't know. Um, probably some security thing back in the day to like fix other bugs where it's like, Oh, this person accidentally lost their verification. Let's just reapply it. Yeah, Drill has 1.8 million followers. And interestingly, is not verified right now. Probably because they changed their name. Slave to woke. All right. Uh, several fake accounts were also verified, including a fake Hillary Clinton uh, and an account pretending to represent a Sudanese paramilitary group when these tweeted falsely that the group's leader had died. Um, okay. Claiming that celebrities have subscribed to Twitter Blue when they have not may qualify as, in quotes, false endorsement and expose Twitter to legal action. Uh, I suspect unless Twitter goes, sorry, it was a bug. And then the whole thing goes away. Yeah, I mean... I don't know. I, I, that could be the defense. They could also come up with something more creative. There was the uh, super creative, uh, you can't tell that that was me. It could have been a deep fake defense. For I don't, I particularly try not to follow this stuff, so I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Uh, I we talked on the show about how this was going to happen, though. Yeah, like a hundred percent. Because when when the defake stuff gets convincing enough, you you can not only not really be able to believe what is actually real, but you also, if something is real, it becomes hard. It becomes very easy for people to kind of. Be like, nah, it's fake. Yeah, this is uh, this is great. Uh, Tesla defense lawyers tell the court that Elon Musk's statements could be deep fakes, uh, and this is in. Um, Do they just mean broadly, or are they talking about one specific thing? The judge in the autopilot death case, uh, where this is where this is being presented, says that oh. this defense argument is deeply troubling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is, especially because they they weren't, like, but they're saying, but they could be. So anything that he's ever said about the capabilities of autopilot or whatever else, basically they're saying, unless you were there in person, you have no way of knowing that it wasn't a deep fake. So it should be just, what, inadmissible or? <laughs> what a wild time. Is this a wild time or what? Twitter sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's convenient for connecting to people that you might need to talk to because it has a lot of people on it. It's my number one source of which celebrity died today. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> that probably makes sense. <laughs> that's how I found out that... Um... Oh, shoot. Now it's escaped me. I, I only know this because uh, Bob Barker was trending, and I was like, no, not Bob Barker! And it was people being glad that it wasn't Bob Barker. <laughs> um, oh, oh, Jerry Springer. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was Jerry, Jerry Springer. I was going to say that would make me feel really bad for who it was, but then. Um, oof. 
Wow, I think that's a too soon right there. I can't say I was a fan of the man's work necessarily, but I don't wow. I don't know him personally at all. I wow. just I just... <laughs> I was probably too far. <laughs> I'm not going to start talking and get you out of this. <laughs> uh, I can. Let's start talking about Twitter. Uh, Linus is getting a cosmetic procedure. Yeah. So. What? Why? Where? I, how? I'm going to get when? microneedling. What is that? It's where they take a needle and they stab your face over and over and over your and face. over and 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 over again. Wow. Many, 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 many times. It's like getting a tattoo, but there's no ink, essentially. Okay. Yeah, so the idea is that it uh, basically, like... Scars you. <laughs> destroys... No, no, it doesn't. I'm kidding, Super I'm kidding, small needle. Yeah, it yeah. basically, like, destroys all the, the very top layer of tissue, or, or, like, skin on your face, and it promotes collagen production. So like, a, like a recycling thing, basically? Yeah, or? pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, just... So it's not... It's... You know what's interesting is I was... Are you awake for this? Oh, yeah. There's like a numbing cream, okay. so hopefully that'll help. Yeah, it's tomorrow, <laughs> doesn't sound so. comfortable. I've no, had it really um, my I've had a lot of issues all over the place. So they put a whole ton of uh, needles in my quad once. Oh yeah, um, and my my quad spasmed because of it, which is something they told me that could happen. Um, okay. All right, um, my quad spasmed, and I bent all of the needles like sick oh yeah you've told like me about bunch. that that's hilarious yeah that was really brutal is it possible that like your cheek could go and it like bends needles in your face i doubt it i don't see why it would do if they you're leave numbed. them in or are they just going no it's like it's like it's more like a tattoo like a sewing machine <laughs> yeah okay. okay yeah yeah so wow uh i was actually like i was pretty i was pretty anti any kind of rejuvenating procedure until it was actually david here that I was having a conversation with. I'll always remember this because it was on this whirlwind trip to Germany that we took where we were there and back and like, if, if it was if it was more than 48 hours, it wasn't by much. And that's a long flight. And that included shooting a video. It was, it was, it was a tough trip, but we did manage to get out and just kind of hang out for a little bit. And he presented me with a viewpoint that I hadn't really considered before. And he was like, yeah, I'm not super into like, like altering your appearance dynamically, but I don't see anything wrong with maintenance in much the same way that you might put a fresh coat of paint on your house. If it's looking dilapidated, I don't see anything wrong with putting a fresh coat of paint on your body. And I was like, okay. So all it does is it stimulates the body's natural collagen production that lowers as you age. Uh, so it'll, it helps to reduce wrinkles and just kind of generally rejuvenates your skin. So I'm like, you know what? All right, I'll give it a shot. I don't see why not. It's like a few hundred bucks, I think. I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, it's probably going to be very painful. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, depends how good the numbing cream is. But like getting a tattoo on your face sounds like it would suck. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, well, if Darth Maul can do it, then all I have to do is <laughs> channel the dark side of the forest and I should be fine. You should like, <laughs> you should troll your kids that way. Like tell them you're going to get this thing done and then come back with like a, like a <laughs> face paint. <laughs> Darth Maul face paint. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll need it. <laughs> oh, oh God. God. The like, face will be quite red. You look really red. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd be really irritated. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, is this messages. new news for LTS? This looks like a lot of new news. Wow. Oh, are we like officially announcing all the booths? This is cool. Yeah, let's talk about it. Sure. Okay. LTX 2023 brought to you by Asus ROG. I don't know if that was announced before, but that's a thing now. Um, for creators, we have a bunch more creators confirming their attendance to uh, LTX 2023. I can bring it up, but I feel like you probably should. Um, if any other creators are interested um, and are currently hearing about LTX and want to attend, reach out uh, to info at ltxexpo.com. Here's our creators page. Do, do, There's do. a bunch. We have a pretty big creator budget this year. Wow. See any big names? Yeah, you I do. I see a lot of names. Yeah, and you do. And a bunch of them are big. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Heck yeah. Is this freaking awesome or what? I'm just excited to like meet up with a bunch of these people. I know, right? A well, bunch we of these people I want to meet for the first time and a bunch of them I haven't seen in years because... 
I haven't been out. Yeah, is this sick or what? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I'm super excited. It's going to be awesome. Other than meeting very cool creators, there's a bunch of other things you can do. There's booths for a 3D printing workshop, a build your own screwdriver with like different colors and all this kind of stuff, a sim racing setup with four to eight rigs. Wow. Um, an NZXT case toss with three lanes. Yeah, three lane case toss. The line was so long. It was. And we're going to have more people this year. We, I think we have almost as many tickets sold now as we did last time, but wait for it. We haven't published a main channel video announcing it yet. Oh, whoa. Yeah. We definitely did last time. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's like people want to get out and hang out and see things and people. I've also talked to a bunch of people that are just very excited because they went last time and it was so good and they want to go again. Like, there's a lot of hype of, like, we could finally do it, I got... Um, the, there's an Epic Games uh, collaboration with PC Building Simulator 2. Uh, they sponsored a water cooling workshop. Super cool. Google Pixel will be sponsoring the meet and greet area. Neat. Uh, MSI, Kioxia, the Gaming Stadium, London Drugs, DD Mikes, and Ridge Wallet, and Silverstone, and more are coming on board to be sponsors of the event. Uh, whale PCs. We announced on Twitter that Starforge Systems will be building our whale PCs. And LTX merch reservations. Reserve merch for pickup during the expo. Oh, yeah. So here is what it all looks like. <gasps> the sweater and the shirt are so sick. Yeah. They're so cool. <laughs> I'm pretty stoked. Um, now, there is a way. We, we talked about this. Uh, before where we had said that LTX exclusive merch, so this stuff, was not going to be available online. We have found a way that maintains the, you know, the, the integrity of the exclusivity of event merch, but also makes it available online. So what we've done is we've created a digital pass. And it's as simple as subscribing on Floatplane at the $10 tier. So if you're subscribed on Floatplane, uh, you'll get a whole bunch of content from the event. So all the panels, uh, any of the games that we play on stage, uh, we're going to have our social team, which is like three or four people now. Yeah, yeah they do just, a great job. Yeah, they do a great job. They're going to be running around filming stuff, basically just going straight from SD card to Floatplane, throw a title on it. They're going to, their, their directive is upload. Pump content. Upload, no delay. Go shoot something, walk back to the computer, press upload, title it, walk away and shoot something else. Like, let's go. Um, so all of that will be going to the $10 tier, all that LTX content. Uh, some of it may be available at the $5 tier. I think live streams, we have no way of differentiating right now. It's just not a feature that the platform supports. So if we were to do anything live, that might be available. And we might do, you know, maybe a more produced summary video or behind the scenes or something like that that's available to all Floatplane subscribers. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be treating the Floatplane digital pass as the $10 tier. And the $10 tier will include the digital uh, the, or LTX digital pass. Um, yeah, yeah, L yeah, LTX. We thought sure. about just doing it as like a one time, like, like digital ticket, but the reality of it is that um, that would be development work. And this is too, but this is more useful for like other things and kind of scales and stuff like that. So it makes sense. Yeah. So this is, this is, makes this makes sense. a lot more sense. And for those of you who are like upset and worried that this is going to be like a, a cash grab or whatever else, you could just subscribe for the one month. Like, that's fine. I don't care. Like, do, do do whatever works for you. So then if you're not subscribed at all, it's 10 bucks. And if you're subscribed at a different tier, like if you're at the $3 OG tier, for example, it's $7. And then if you're an OG once, you're an OG forever. So you can always yeah, you can go back to your downgrade back to your $3 tier. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, there you go. Right? Cool. Not too bad. Not too bad. Your OG can theoretically rot if you unsubscribe and cancel your subscription entirely for a significant period of time. Oh, really? Theoretically. Oh, okay. If people email customer support, we usually just honor it anyways. 
Well, that's because customer support here has the make it right directive. Yeah. So like, trust me, bro. It's fine. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't go away if you like move your subscription tier around. Like your, I, your flag is. I love is all preserved. the people that are looking at stuff we've done lately and been like, yeah, I think with, you know, the things that LMG and the store and everything have been doing lately, you know, I think that, I think that, you know, they can say, trust me, bro. Now it was never different. <laughs> it was always the same. <laughs> Yeah, we were just sitting in a very like potential energy state with like a bunch of things not released yeah. yet and stuff like that. But it doesn't mean that things changed. Nothing changed. <laughs> um, ooh, people are asking, what if they that paid is for the year? I just saw that. That is complicated. Boo. Um, Luke, we'll figure that out and get back to you. Sick. Ha. Uh, Got him. I can't pick Actually, up my phone really or else question. I'll buzz the stream. Can you schedule a message for me on Monday, Dan, about that? If you were paying attention. Thank you. Huh. Yeah, that's a... That is complicated. Really good question. Could we just we'll figure something issue out. a partial refund, like prorated, and then they could sign up for an annual... I'm not committing to anything. We'll okay. figure something out. All right, cool. Yeah, because the accounting department's going to have to sign off on whatever it is we do. Let me... T oh, man. Let me tell you. Figuring out how to handle being able to take Canadian cash at the event <laughs> and multiple currencies for... Um, for like for pre-orders or for reservations Whew. been very challenging very very challenging because the last thing we want to do is create a situation where as as exchange rates fluctuate in the months leading up to the event people who reserve before paid more or something compared to when they get there and but the, if we peg it now how do we avoid that um how do we do the accounting for these fluctuations if we took the money then, but then the value of that money changed by X amount between now and then? It's like really, it's really bad. It's really dumb. <laughs> cool. Anyway, this is the LTX exclusive merch. We've got the three designer series desk pads, Fantastic. all of which look amazing. I think oh, yeah. the toughest decision here is which two to buy. Um, <laughs> then, yeah, we've got the tie-dye shirt the tie-dye hoodie, uh, the flag. So the idea with the flag is that it's it's not huge. It's more for carrying around and like, you know, writing messages on friends that you oh, meet there. Okay. Really cool like, thing to get signed. Yes, exactly. Yeah, sweet. And then we've got the gradient enamel pin. Yeah, because these shirts aren't super signable. No, not really. Whereas some previous year ones with a silver Sharpie were. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that makes sense. I've got people in Twitch chat. Good old Twitch chat. The fluctuations wouldn't be that big. Yes, they would. What fluctuations? Sorry. Between the USD and CAD. <laughs> I mean, we... we just, yeah, traditionally, no, you're right. Lately? Lately, I mean, I, I might still have a tab open with it because Woo! I've been watching it really closely lately. Um, yeah. In the last one month, it's gone from uh, $1.36 all the way down to almost $1.33 all the way up to a dollar thirty-seven. Okay, that's huge. Massive in business terms, like three or four cents on the dollar over a span of a couple of weeks. How on earth are you supposed to plan around that? It's wild. Try, try, trying to hire people that want to work remote in other currencies. Oh yeah, cool. <laughs> and negotiate, trying to figure out wages and stuff. It's a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Anyways, that's LTX. It's coming soon. Super excited. Genuinely super excited. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? Oh, we're supposed to do three merch messages. Dan, hit me. Second here. Segway was too fast for me. <laughs> My level back up. There we are. Um, hey, DLL, what are your thoughts on cheaper versus more expensive motherboard chipsets? Is it worth spending more on a high-end or low-end chipsets enough for most people? Chipset? That's really going to depend on your use case. Yeah, it used to matter a lot more because yeah. vendors would lock important features like SLI, for example. You could only run two GPUs on a more expensive chipset, not because of any reason other than that. Well, if you can afford two GPUs, you can afford a more expensive motherboard. Go f*** yourself, right? Like, that was the that was it. That was the entire rationale, right? Um, these days, though, man, I mean, the first time I saw a B-series gaming motherboard, 
almost 10 years ago now, I think. I was like, really? You know, because the difference in price was not that much between yeah. an entry level, I guess it would have been P series at the time, or had we moved on to Z yet for performance? I'm not sure. But between the entry level performance tier chipset boards and this like high end B, which used to mean business, I think. Uh, if I recall correctly, um, and this high-end like business chipset board, it was like uh, five bucks or something like that. I'm going well, pff, just just get the get the performance tier board, and then get unlocked overclocking, which mattered back then because you could actually get more performance out of your chips because they weren't redlined out of the factory. Uh, but these days, frankly, if I was spending my own money, I can't think of any reason that I would go with a higher tier chipset. Like, yeah, you get more, like, USB ports or whatever, but when's the last time that you were limited by the number of USB ports on your motherboard? Remember, USB hubs are available for as little as $6. Yeah. I don't like them. <laughs> sure. Do you <laughs> like you running like a cable farther down to your computer? Stuff. Uh, oh, come on, you're not charging devices off your computer. I do. Sometimes. My phone. Okay. Then use the front USB port on your case. That's gross. I don't want to do that. Front USB ports are just for like flash drives, other temporarily plugged in things. It's hilarious that you guys call me out of touch. <laughs> yeah, what the hell is that, Luke? <laughs> what is what? I have I have a, 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 a USB extension multi-port thingy as well. I would just go basic, especially on AMD where there's no overclocking locks and you can do whatever you want even with the low end stuff the only difference is pcie lanes which it's like okay yeah how many nvme drives do you actually need um and then uh what's the other difference yeah like more usb ports which i don't need unless there's a particular feature that's only really present on high-end boards that i do need uh, so one of the things that i use a lot is thunderbolt because i use optical cables to run my system in various parts of my house that i have conduit running to and i have optical thunderbolt cables i know where you're going with this just stop <laughs> <laughs> the point is if there's a particular feature that only happens to be present on high-end chipset boards then yeah i guess by all means spring for it but otherwise no there's no real reason to do that Okay. <laughs> Cheated, <laughs> Luke. <laughs> Worst takes. Uh, oh, I've got one here for Luke. Uh, this is from Steve. Hey. Luke, if you had the opportunity to use your development team for another company's product or project, which would possibly take time away from Floatplane but would provide <sighs> a bunch of revenue, would you do it? I mean, he does it every day. They don't only work on Floatplane.com. Yeah. It's more of like an internal development team at this point. It's like amazing. Yeah, the, the company that is Floatplane uh, does a lot of different things. A ton of different things. Uh, we've, we have considered being a dev house for outside companies before. This was a long time ago. Um, and it's a, hard, it's a hard sell just because we have so many internal opportunities to work on things, to make things better, to, to expand what we do in general like there's there's so much that we have to do in-house um that it hasn't made a lot of sense to like kind of like share with an outside company if you know what i mean um is it possible sure but the way that we would probably do it instead is just make a tool and then like sell or make that tool available for a subscription or whatever whatever type of thing makes sense for whatever type of tool it is um, probably wouldn't like do contract work for an outside company. That is a thing that dev houses do yeah. and they're very good at it. We're just really that's busy. that's great. It's just, it probably doesn't make sense for us. Yeah. Speaking of float plane, uh, there's an exclusive that went up today and I'm not going to name any names and I'm not going to watch this video, but at least one of these people is probably at least a little spicy. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is um, this is we're we're posting the full interviews for the what's it like to work at Linus. Is that Media how do you, you really read the comments or something, or just know the person? No, oh, no, I just I just know all these people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. work with them, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just very sure that at least one of them will be a little spicy. <laughs> Uh, for those wondering, um, that's Maria, one of our graphic designers. Uh, Riley, who I think you know, he runs TechLinked, and have we announced GameLinked yet? Well, soon uh, he'll be managing the linked team, 
yeah. in general. Uh, that's Sarah, the one and only Ms. Butt, um, also one of our graphic designers, and that's Tim from the lab. Okay, here comes another one. With Luke calling companies and organizing spinning up their own LLMs, will smaller companies that collect training data and create custom AIs become a new space for startups? Hmm. Can you rephrase the, the end of that? that was really okay, easy. he's basically asking, is companies that aggregate data and then create these highly customized uh, large language models going to be a new space for startups? Oh, uh, yes, and it's already happening. I mean, what's really interesting is um, OpenAI's CEO came out very recently and said, look, uh, the next frontier is not going to be just building bigger models. Yeah. It's going to be it's going to be building better models. Yep. And I think you've basically hit the nail on the head. I don't need uh, a, a generalized model that was trained on a quadrillion data points necessarily. But what, you might need like one model that, because a, a huge problem that we're running into is licensing of data and information. So a lot of what LLMs are currently trained on right now include things like pirated books um, and other things that like clearly they should not have access to. And then there's things that like is maybe a little bit of a gray area, like Reddit posts and Stack Overflow things and stuff like that, which is currently going through the the ever churning process of capitalism to figure out how those companies can try to um, charge OpenAI for that access or, or however that's going to go. So the data set that these things are able to train off in the future is going to be interesting and is going to potentially change. The current data sets that are out there are out there because yep. they're open source and downloadable. Wild West, baby! People have them. You can't take it back at this point, but moving forward, it could change. And there is absolutely space, and this is currently happening for, say, a medical model that is trained from uh, textbooks or papers from certain publishers, and they have agreements with those publishers in order to have that data, and it is trained on all of that information for um, helping to educate medical students all the way up to um, helping to inform and, and drive uh, medical science and medical practice at hospitals and universities and everything that is currently happening. So making LLMs that are grounded in one specific space is totally going to be a thing um, and is literally already a thing to a certain degree. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's head on to some rapid fire. Holy crap. I didn't even realize this, um, but the game linked branding is up. Oh. It looks pretty good. Yeah. We nice. haven't um yeah, we haven't announced anything yet apparently. People are like Yeah, Linus casually just like leaked an upcoming channel. Uh yeah, so we talked um, about it before. We have. We have? We have. Oh, okay. Yeah, there Ever you go. so briefly. Oh, 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 we got it. We got it this moment. Nice. <laughs> You think it'll have a, a hundred thousand subscriber plaque before it uh, releases a video? That'd be kind of fun. That's always. A, Should we try and do that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm down. Guaranteed success. It's not that I want to take on Jack Sucks at Life for like you know play button collection or whatever, but like, I mean, I'm always I'm always down for another play button for the wall. <laughs> yeah. um, someone someone asked me the other day, like, um, I I, I oh, man. No, no, it wasn't you. It was someone else. But I was, I was showing my my play button wall. We were, we were shooting at um at my house. Oh, we shot Yvonne's AMD Ultimate Tech upgrade this oh, cool. week. Yeah. So one of the, one of the crew that was there helping with the shoot was like, oh yeah, you know, her space looks so nice now and so cohesive, and yours just has all those play buttons on that one wall. Are you gonna put anything on this wall? And I'm like, yeah, more f***ing play buttons. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apparently, it's past a thousand already. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> now we just have to do that a hundred times. See, look how easy it is to get a hundred thousand subscribers. Yeah, no problem. Just do that, then do it a hundred times, and then if you want to get a million, well, you just do that ten more times. And then if you want ten million, we'll do it ten more times. Easy. Yeah. I don't know why people think it's so hard. Slash s slash s. We just relax all day. <laughs> it's very easy. There's no stress here. I'm okay. 
Everything's fine. The carpet isn't for like laying down when you're completely stressed out and need to think. The carpet's for just taking naps because that's all. That's like half of what people do. It's good for crying. Just as take well. a break. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Rapid fire. Come on. Yeah. Okay. I will rapid fire. You better. Luke and Linus, if given an unlimited budget and only allowed to purchase one single item, what would you buy? It's a really hard one to think about immediately. The biggest piece of gold. Oh, I... That is a very reasonable sure. answer, actually. I was say the, same thing. <laughs> the biggest satchel of money. Yeah. Uh, something that's a good investment. Not something gold? that depreciates. Google. <laughs> Google. Okay, that's wait, a no, good answer. Microsoft. Microsoft, yeah. That's I'm a gonna, better I'm answer. Pivot. I'm going to pivot. Uh, I don't know, dude. Okay, next. When is part two of the ultimate gaming minivan coming out? Never. No, no, no. Okay, okay, no, we're going to... Okay. Look, if I'm going to have those stupid solar panels on my roof... It does look goofy. <laughs> and I can, I can, I can hear them. When I'm on the highway, like it's not very aerodynamic anymore. Then darn it, I'm gonna have that like battery system, and I'm gonna have those gaming machines. Never mind that my kids all, every single one of them, get really bad motion sickness, and probably won't even be able to use it. I want a gaming. <laughs> you can play when we're parked. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Part two of the NCIX uh, PC is also coming eventually. I think they're making more progress on that one than on the gaming minivan. Part two pizza heater? No. <laughs> gaming pizza oven? <laughs> hey, Linus and Luke, what is your opinion on Interplanetary File System, or IPFS, as a solution to the centralized internet model? Have you ever heard of this? Uh, no. It's, it, yeah. Sorry, Same. me neither. I guess I suck. Okay, next. Since Linus has said before that he rides a motorcycle, have you ever considered making a jacket specifically for riding or even a normal jacket with slots for slide-in attachment of riding armor? No, it's hard. How would you navigate finding an investor or pitch to a company for an organic groundbreaking chip and computational method? Sim testing better than anything we have today, power and performance-wise. That was a good pitch. That sounds like a pitch to me. Seed investment round incoming. Hey, <laughs> seed investment. I get it. <laughs> Because it's an organic chip. Right. What April Fool's Day video was the most fun to... He also said groundbreaking. <laughs> plan or shoot? Ooh. I don't know. They're all so epic and amazing. I, I actually, I love, I love April Fool's. It's my favorite thing. Um, truth about Linus Tech Tips Exposed. I... I unironically really enjoyed when you just threw the computer case outside and then we just left the camera on it for like seven minutes or whatever. I thought that was hilarious. Um, I okay, know my so sense of humor doesn't necessarily align with everyone's, but Luke's I thought it was great. Referring to, why is this so hard to, yeah. This was like 2013 April Fool's or something. Yeah, here it is. Here's the playlist. Okay, so the joke here, love that Twitch shirt. Just filming on the street at the old Langley house is amazing. Good production values. The joke here is that that case, I accidentally unboxed it twice. Yeah. So it was it was on the market and relevant for so long that you literally made two videos without about. realizing it. I made a video about it twice, uh, doing exactly the same thing, like unboxing and kind of giving an overview of it. So what I decided to do, because we just had one kicking around for some reason, maybe for a build or something, I don't remember why we had it, but I was like, haha, wouldn't it be funny if I was like, lol, we're going to unbox this case and we do it a third time. Uh, so the video is 13 minutes long, which would have been a pretty typical length for us to kind of sucker people into thinking that it's a real video. Uh, and then we get as far as taking it out of the box Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, wait for it. Wait for it. It's a Linus classic moment. Yeah. That was on purpose, by the way. You can tell because I'm a very bad actor. Yeah. <laughs> Not as bad as Luke, but very bad. It's true. And then... And now we play the waiting game. <laughs> and then we just filmed the case in the rain for like 10 minutes or something. And people, a bunch of people like hated this. I thought it was so funny. 
I loved this so much. So the it's thing, literally just the worst of the video. So the thing. <laughs> That is amazing. That's art. Yeah. So that's, the thing is, wow. this uh, timeline oh, thumbnail feature didn't exist then. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, people would watch. <laughs> yeah, to say that people weren't that thrilled. Um, <laughs> yeah, people didn't really like it, but it's like actually one of my favorite ones just because I just my sense of humor just really enjoys that. Um, Okay. So hold on a second. Where wait, where'd that where'd that playlist go? Oh, seriously? No. How is this navigation so bad? I clicked on Okay, it? yeah, here it is. So here's the playlist. Oh, wait, okay. what? No. The playlist was two down. Oh. Dang it. So I can't see my screen. This mic is in front of it, okay? Here it <gasps> there. is. Yeah. Playlist. Okay, pause. Oh, okay. This is what I was supposed to do. I I blame the user. Pebcac. Okay, twenty sixteen. <laughs> That was when we made the video claiming we'd been bought out by NVIDIA. The number of people uh, that... Believed that. In terms of believability, I think this might have been the strongest one. Yeah. Because it was a completely straight-faced delivery of something that, I don't know, on the surface of it could kind of make sense. NVIDIA wanting a media company as part of their portfolio or something. Um, and the number of people... So part of our, hmm, part of our April Fool's planning is that... I tend to lean into some kind of conversation yeah, or some kind of they're topical to a certain degree perception. And at that time, one of the the big narratives that existed for whatever reason was that I had my lips wrapped firmly around Nvidia's throbbing ego. And so I basically went, okay, well, given that people believe this anyway, why don't we give them what they want? and claim that we've been outright purchased by NVIDIA. And so the number of people that believed this one was probably the highest out of any. Um, the following year, this one did pretty well. Uh, that This one didn't take a lot of planning. I just like wrote it up. It's only a two-minute video. It was pretty quick. This one took no planning. So you asked which one was the most fun to plan. Um, this one was really fun to plan because it involved pyrotechnics, which I always love. That was real fire in the video. Man, the number of comments insulting our VFX... Uh, talking about what a poor job we did of the fake flat fire. Yeah. It's like, take off your tinfoil hat. It's literally real fire. You ain't as cool as you think you are. That is actual fire. And it's not like we did anything really weird or complicated. We just took a can of hairspray and just lit it and blew it through the, the grate in the door. You're not, you're not clever. You're not, you're not seeing through the... Like, That's like someone who's seen too much VFX. Yeah, maybe. And not enough actual real fire? Yeah, I guess so. And we're like, wait, this doesn't look like my VFX. That's bad. It must be bad VFX. Yeah. No, it's just fire. <laughs> Chill out. Um, the fire pole one was kind of fun, but very last minute. The execution was not that great. I think that's probably my least favorite. You and I actually went down it. You know what? This is my favorite. The concrete cooled PC. That was pretty sick. Uh, I I didn't get to be as involved in the planning of this one. I love the I love the OnlyFans one, but um, I think the concrete PC was my favorite because that was one that I pushed hard for. What one do you think is the best? Because I think the the actual execution and the end result of the product of the We Need to Talk Potato Farm was like outstanding. Very very good. It's definitely the best production value yeah. one. Um, in terms of which one was most profitable, that's got to be this review gets stranger and stranger, the never ending segue where every sponsor did pay us for it. It's like unbelievable, <laughs> but I still love the concrete cooled PC one because everyone internally was like, this is too stupid. <laughs> Nobody will believe this. And the number of people that <laughs> legitimately were like, how'd they do that? I, I'm surprised this worked. Uh, and I've read a lot of comments. I can tell the difference between the ones who are playing along and the ones that are definitely not just playing along. A significant number of people believed we cooled a PC with concrete, asked follow-up questions. We're legitimately curious to learn more about it. Um, and we did such a good job of matching the color of the milk to the concrete. And the way that we filmed it, the way we filmed it out of order to kind of movie magic the whole thing together, I was on set with Alex the whole time filming it. 
And he was telling me the whole time, this is not going to come together. I'm like, no, I have a vision this time. Just trust me. Trust me, bro. And then at the end, he's like, all right. <laughs> all right. That was pretty sweet. Okay, you ready for a few more? Yeah. Okay, let's switch back to potential here. My family uses iMessage to discuss important info, and many of my non-social media friends use group text as SM. Uh, tips for those who are trapped by Apple stubbornness to use RCS. Uh, EU USB-C type law for RCS. Use Signal? And now he's got to convince his parents to move over too. That's... Oh. I'm getting a little fatigued on the amount of different messaging things that I have and needing to remember how every individual person likes to be contacted. It's fine. Here's my folder of all my messaging apps. Oh. I, yeah, it tires me out a little bit. Yeah, uh, here, here, name anyone and I'll tell you where I talk to them. Uh, no. All right. <laughs> Since you're so close to Alberta and make a decent <laughs> and fairly priced versions of whatever you set your mind to, can we please get an LTT cowboy hat? Uh, no. no. <laughs> I should, I should offer a little bit more i shouldn't just be dismissive uh, the reason that i wouldn't is because i tend to focus our product development efforts on things where we are passionate and uh feel that we have something to contribute something to add yeah something to contribute to i think there's a lot of people who are passionate about cowboy hats and make really great cowboy hats and power to them we have a store like literally legitimately basically down the street from here that sells that kind of stuff but that's not a thing that we're exactly known for, you know? So, yeah. Hey guys, love the show. Watch it religiously. Question for Luke. I am currently, I have two budgies and they provide endless entertainment. Mm. What are some of your favorite moments as a bird owner? I was just thinking you put a little knock to a fan in the back. Oh my there God. you go. That's what you can add. Uh, <laughs> Make it out of alpaca fur. <laughs> uh, what is my favorite thing that they do? What's your favorite bird memory? Favorite bird memories is pretty easy. Okay, I'll answer that one. Um, our, our first bird, Taquito, there was a fire um, near my apartment. Like, a, I don't remember if it was a forest fire or it was the a, a, another more different fire that I'm not going to specify. Colton fire? Because I don't want to um. give away where I'm at. Uh, <laughs> but there was a fire that was leaving a lot of smoke in the air. And a solution that I came up with was uh, to bring the, the bird in the cage and everything into the bathroom and then run the shower so that there was a little bit of a barrier and the moisture in the air and the shower would yeah, pull should particulate. Grab some of the per yeah, so th that was the plan. Um, and I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if he was going to freak out because um, he's like, had never been into my room, let alone the bathroom attached to it, had never been next to a shower, all this type of stuff. But I put the cage down. I just lay down next to the cage and I'm just like, I, I play music that he likes. And he was just stoked. He was like, oh, sick. We get to we get to hang out. Oh, that's cool. And he just like played around and sung songs and was just happy and cool about it. And that was just, that was a cool moment. I tend to, if you listen to me tell stories about anything, I tend to enjoy the ones where there's a large conflict and we are able to overcome. We win. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next. Oh, give me one more. You want one more? Yes. Okay. One more. Um, hi, future me. I would love to see a way to listen to the show like an audio podcast on float plane for when I am driving. Is there some audio podcast that you are listening to on a regular basis? Oh, that wasn't where I thought that was going to go. M me too. Uh, we, that was we, a, that was a could, statement. We could upload an audio form of, the, for sure, that's possible. Yeah, can we can we do that? That Dan? would just have to be process involved. Who, who does that? Do, don't we support audio? Yes. Yeah, but, so we but would there just would have be, to... Someone would have to, you know... I yeah, do it. But that's like a Linus Media Group process, not a float plane process that yeah. has to be changed, right? Yeah, Dan I think there was something on my to-do list to like look at the podcast for like workflow. Uh, I'll see if I can automate that. Okay. Uh, typing. Okay, cool. Because you can also like Fix. edit the post afterwards and add it. Okay. Yeah, it would just do like an auto-generated Why don't we do a topic while you uh, work on that then? Okay, I'll get oh. that done by the end of the show. UK regulators have blocked... The Microsoft Activision Blizzard deal. 
Yeah, which like might be a good thing. I don't know. I don't know enough about this, but the reason for it was kind of funky. Yeah, that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to find this. I'll read through it once I find it. Uh, there it is. Um, UK regulators have blocked Microsoft's proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard on the grounds that it will reduce competition in cloud gaming, which is the competition uh, and markets which... Hmm. which the Competition and Markets Authority sees as a low-cost alternative to consoles. Sure, because it sort of is. Uh, Microsoft does control around 60 to 70% of the cloud gaming market, which is less than 1% of the total global gaming market. However, regulators cited estimates that it will grow to around 9% of the market by 2026. I haven't seen a ton of things moving that direction, to be completely honest. Yeah. So I don't know where that number is necessarily coming from, but... 9% would be a lot of the gaming market to be happening over the cloud instead of... like That would have a very a, major That shift. would have a significant impact on web traffic. Yeah. Like that's... Genuinely. Okay. That's a, that's a big number that I, I would kind of bet against, to be completely honest. Um, again... I don't know if this should happen or not. I'm not weighing in on that. I just, the, the reasoning seems funky. Um, Blizzard has been struggling with ugly labor disputes and their stock price has dropped 11% after the announcement was made. While Microsoft's own stock rose by 8%. I'm surprised it's honestly that low. They've been kind of killing it. Um, an Activision spokesperson has said that they will work aggressively with Microsoft to appeal the decision and that the UK is clearly closed for business. Is that That's a, a sex thing? Work aggressively together? <laughs> Uh, that sounds like a euphemism. <laughs> I do know this is this is a uh, like if I said I was going to work aggressively with you, what would you, you know, think of that? I mean, no doubt. HR. <laughs> <laughs> HR is not needed if there's no problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do know Blizzard is having a problem right now where they're losing a lot of talent. Uh, apparently, yeah. they hired people during COVID um, that like was under the stand under bleh, which were hired with the understanding that they were full time work from home permanently. Right, and then they have called them into work. So some of these people were hired living nowhere even near to Blizzard, and now they need to come into work. Right. Which there's problems with that because yeah, relocating. Yeah, because if they don't live near a blizzard, they probably don't have snow tires already. <laughs> relocating uh, your entire family is an issue. Now these people might have to live in much higher cost of living areas. Higher which... temperature areas. <laughs> Based on where Blizzard is, that's actually very likely true. Yeah. For... <laughs> <laughs> for where, for where these people are are probably coming from, um, but yeah, it's it's an issue. So a lot of those people are just saying like, no, uh, see ya, I quit. I guess that's a really rude hand gesture in some places, but okay. Is it peace? Uh, this is peace. Did you do it backwards? What does that you mean? You didn't show the back of your hand, did you? <sighs> oh, what does it mean? We gotta blur that. Inform me. Don't what worry about it? it. What is it? Okay. I genuinely don't know. Um. Anyways, they're saying <laughs> peace and then leaving. Um, man, they, it shouldn't even be allowed for two gestures to be that similar, and one of them's cool and one of them's not. That's ridiculous. Well, uh, I mean, what 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 was it? Okay, and white power being the exact same hand gesture, but just if the orientation. If you, if you do scuba diving, like, come on! If you do scuba diving, it's like, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so dark. I can't tell what color any of us are down here. <laughs> Oh man! Um, in the UK, the backwards peace sign is a middle finger. Why? I don't. I mean, anyways, moving on. Um, yeah, so a lot of them are quitting. So they're having this huge like brain drain talent issue, and it's kind of weird because a lot of actually good things for Blizzard in regards to development, and getting timelines underway, and, and roadmaps, and all this kind of stuff happened over the COVID period with all these people working from home. So like. I don't know, but yeah. Ooh, Colorado confirms farmers right to repair. Colorado is the first state to pass a law guaranteeing farmers the right to repair their own equipment. Manufacturers will be required to provide parts, embedded software, firmware, tools, and any relevant documentation to equipment owners and independent repair providers. Failing to provide these resources will be considered a deceptive trade practice under Colorado law. Ooh. 
Very good. Very good. Manufacturers will no longer be allowed to discourage owners from making their own repairs or require independent repair providers to undergo any kind of certification to become an authorized repair provider. So it just has to be, you know, free market and you have to be a good repair provider and have a good reputation and business will come. And that's how it's supposed to work. John Deere stated that the law is unnecessary. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And will have unintended consequences for its customers. Well, yeah, unintended by you. We know what your intentions were, you (laughs) jackasses. Uh, John Deere is facing a class action lawsuit for alleged monopolization of repair services, as well as several antitrust lawsuits. Now, I can't wait for this to come for the McDonald's ice cream machines. (laughs) Well, there's actually like a bunch of, do you know about that? Some contract that they have where they like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, There are currently 15 other states with pending right to repair legislation for farmers, and Colorado has recently passed another law ensuring the right to repair motorized wheelchairs. Oh, cool. Like... I didn't really think about that, but that totally makes sense. Is this finally happening? Slowly, but maybe. I keep hearing, whenever this type of stuff happens, I keep hearing like, oh yeah, right to repair, win! And then a few days later, you hear like... Uh, yeah, but it's bad. Yeah, this like one in the seems, same bill. They snuck in a bunch of stuff. This sucks. one seems like it might actually be good. It seems, yeah, which is really, really exciting. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, float plane chat. All my homies hate monopolies. Hundred percent, exactly. Last topic, I think. Nah, I'm bored of that one. Okay, I think it's boring. All right, let's switch to Wan Show after dark. All right, you ready, Dan? People on LMG clips are super confused. About what? About Wan Show After Dark. Because it's really dark yeah, sometimes. Yeah, because there's just a clip. They have no and context. It's just dark. Yeah, they don't know about Wan Show After Dark yet. So, <laughs> our Wan Show homies who actually watch the show, um, you know, if you see people confused, help point them toward the light or, well, the dark. Yeah. Point them toward the answer. How, uh, how overwhelmed are the message boards today, Dan? A little bit overwhelming. You did a couple of segments where I had to not be at my desk, um, but I almost got through it, and now we're here. <laughs> uh, so wow, towel sales are up seven thousand eight hundred and sixty-seven percent. That makes sense. Where yeah. does that number come from? No, seriously though, how do you derive that from two hundred and thirty-nine units? I bet you it's an average over time, and we ran out of stock of the other ones, right? Yeah. So it would have been zero for a very long time. So maybe we sold one but not towel zero before then in the last, you know, three months. So then it's like point something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, most popular items today. You didn't ask, but I'm answering it for you. <laughs> are towels? You guys are super into the towels being restocked. You know what? That's probably a combination of also people back in stock. having yeah back in stock notifications. Uh, screwdriver. Always popular. Uh, Northern Lights t-shirt. Yeah, the Northern Lights t-shirt is going to be a killer. It's a good design. Yeah. Um, Then a bunch of freebies, uh, animal sticker packs. Uh, What else we got here? Screwdriver bit sets. We sell so many more bit sets than I imagined we would. I just kind of thought most people would be like, yeah, I don't know. It's a screwdriver. I'll just use whatever the bits are coming. Nope. Nope. The attach rate on bit sets is like over 30%. I think it's like 40% or something like that. Yeah, it's wild. Um, Backpacks. Oh, right. That makes sense because we are doing the promo today. Um, Free sequin pillow. Is that towel actually white? Someone's asking if it's actually white or gray. It looks actually white to me. I would say that is white. I think we should update the color on the site to say actually white. Yeah. I, I, I kind of like that name for a... I kind of like that name for a... <laughs> just, you know, a, a, a white, you know? It's like... Uh, it's a great way to describe a Karen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dan, hit me. Sure, just let me give me a second. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, oh. all right. First, first up, uh, Linus, uh, what amount per month would it take to have YouTube Premium remove all ads, both AdSense and in video? I'm starting to see videos with 50% ad reads, not LTT. YouTube Premium is supposed to get rid of ads. <sighs> Well, it would be irresponsible of me, or not irresponsible, it would be dishonest of me to not bring up that there is a solution to that problem. Um, It doesn't work on every platform, but there's a third-party extension called Sponsor Block that will actually remove self-promotion, baked-in advertising. Obviously, as a content creator, I'm going to give you the other side of that coin. 
Um, you know, I can't speak for everyone else, but I will say that we're always trying to find a good balance of um, talking about services we offer like Floatplane, talking about the merch on LTT store, uh, talking about um, our the sponsors that help make our production possible. Uh, not everyone finds the right balance, but they also might be going through harder times than than you know they 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 might need it. So as I as I've said in the past, and as I will continue to say, because nothing other people say about it really changes anything. Uh, you just you gotta you gotta understand what you're doing. Um, if that's the price of admission that they set for the content, then if you want to consume that content, they're the ones who set the price. Um, there's also nothing that they can do to prevent you from just, you know, pressing the arrow key. Like that's another really quick way of skipping something if you don't want to watch it. No one, no one can force you to watch something that you don't want to watch. Um, so yeah, you just gotta, you gotta weigh how much you want to support the creators that you watch. And presumably this is creators you watch, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't have brought it up with me. Um, and how much you are willing to not support them, knowing that if you don't support them at some point, they could go away or their model could shift and they might not be able to make the content that you're apparently enjoying. Okay, up next. Oh, I didn't actually answer the question. Oh, yeah, What amount would it take per month? Um, I think the best way for me to answer that is to refer back to our How Does LMG Make Money 2020 update. So we've got a breakdown here. Uh, here we go. I hate that the preview doesn't take you... Like, see this preview? That doesn't take you to before that image. I consider that a bug. That should take you to before that image, so that you will see that image. Anyway. <laughs> 20, oh. Oh, shoot, it's not done yet. Do we... When do we fill out the whole thing? Gosh darn it, Linus. Get on with it. Here we go. Okay, so right now, 18%... Oh, this is 2016. Here's 2020. Thank ya. It's great. It's a good good platform, good, good, video, good content creator. All right, so in 2020... 26% of our revenue was AdSense, with 27% being in-video sponsor spots and sponsored projects. So based on this alone, I would say that there would be absolutely no need for us to have in-video sponsor spots or sponsored projects, which both kind of fall under sponsored videos, if our CPMs were triple what they are. With that said, I don't think that content creators would necessarily see it that way. Like if YouTube came to us and said, yeah, we're going to we're gonna triple your payout, um, I think that, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I think that for myself, I would go, sick, let's hire more people and build more, right? So no. I wouldn't necessarily stop making sponsorship spots or, you know, float plane reads or whatever else into our videos. Uh, I'd probably just try to build it, build it bigger. I feel like that will always be Linus's answer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, had I gotta a, be me. <laughs> we, we had a call earlier this week with, with a company who was very, very surprised at the amount of stuff that we do and the amount of like collaboration between teams that we need. They were like, we have literally never seen this. And I'm like, eh, it's not surprising, but we still need this to work. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave it vague like that. But like, yeah, I, I think if there's opportunity to do more stuff, it's pretty much always going to be taken. As long as it's reasonable, I guess. Mm. Okay, next up. What's your favorite memory of experiencing new tech? Did anything blow your mind for the first time you saw it? Thanks for the great content. He's going to say VR. <laughs> um, Actually, no. I had a different thing I was going to say, but I was fighting between the two of them in my head. The 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 Bing chat reaction that we had on WAN was like pretty oh, sick. Oh yeah, certainly recently. That's, I don't know if it's my favorite memory though. That's the biggest mind absolutely yes, yeah. blown moment. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, there's been so many, and and there's different ways for your mind to be blown, right? Like my mind was very blown uh, the first time I was able to game in stereo 3D. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Having that at home in my lifetime wasn't a thing that had existed, and in such a such a compact, manageable package like Batman, Batman Arkham Asylum, 3D Vision was 
sick. And then the fact that you could do it with projectors, like, wow, so cool. Um, but like, sometimes I'm just blown away by the value of something, you know, like what about, what about the, the, the bang for the buck of the 8,800 GT? I mean, I don't think anything will ever touch it again. Um, 8800 was a hell of a time. It was a it was a wonderful time oh, for yeah. PC gaming. Oh yeah, it was good. Future felt bright. <laughs> yeah, but then like recently, man, uh, we were doing this small form factor build. That the video is not up yet, but it's coming soon. But I for, I forget what the wattage of it is. But it was like a 1200 watt power supply, and it was like this big. I'm like what? <laughs> right? Like I don't know. My wow. mind. My my entire job is basically to get my mind blown on a regular basis. Yeah. It's no wonder I'm always so relaxed and in such a good mood. <laughs> Hit me again. You're, you're also very honest. Uh, all right, next up. Luke and Linus, what are your thoughts on game devs hosting old but still popular multiplayer games like Team Fortress 2 without anti-cheat updates and instead relying entirely on modded and community support? This might not be taken super... People might not like me for this, is what I should say. But sure, it's better than them taking everything out and offlining the game completely. It's not like the best solution. If there's a lot of people still playing your game, I would like to see it supported. But when was TF2 first launch? Oh my God, like 15 years ago or something? Like Orange Box 2007? It was launched before Orange Box. 2004 then, maybe? No. 2007. Not... Yeah. October 10th, 2004. Wait, no, that is the Orange Box. It wasn't... Launched with Orange Box. Yeah, it was. 2004 was Half Life Two. Half Life. No, wait, hold on. It was launched alongside Portal, wasn't it? These are like the only two dates that I know. Yeah, Portal came out in October 2007. Oh wow, it was with Orange Box. I thought it existed before Orange Box. No. Crazy. Okay. Well, never mind then. Um. Yeah, it's been a lot of years. I think it would be quite the stretch to expect companies to support games for longer than that. Yes, it still has a big player base, but then are you asking well, companies? They're to also integrate? still making money on that game, so I do expect support. But go on. Are they? What, what are they? Selling? We're talking about hat trading yeah. simulator. Yeah. They they sell the hats. You can buy them. I think so. I thought they were just like random loot. I don't know. I don't. You have to buy care unlock that keys part of the game to unlock crates to get, unlock the hats. You get the hats. crates and you buy keys. Yeah, like and I think there's also crafting. If they're still profiting off of it, like damn, yeah, they should still support it properly. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, if they're not profiting off of it anymore, um, then it is what it is. At, at least they're keeping it up there, and they have the availability of people being able to patch things. That's great. Apparently, it's big for gambling. Oh, great. (laughs) All right. Next one. Another one. Hey, LLND and future me, I always watch the show the next morning, but do you think there's any good way to have a town square social platform that truly uh, truly reaches everyone and can be a public utility? In my utopian nirvana, yes. Um, it, in order for it to be a public utility, it would have to actually have to be publicly owned. So it would have to be government run and to be government run and still viable, it would have to be efficient, which is sort of a contradiction, right? So we want it to be run with the efficiency of a cutthroat for profit enterprise, but we want it to have the, the openness of a publicly funded entity like a library or a school. Um, no, I don't. Me either. I don't see a path to that. I mean, I would I would have liked to believe that, you know, through something like blockchain technology, you, you could build something like that, but the crypto community has been really busy building Ponzi schemes. Yeah. Um, so they haven't really had time for... Um... It's super sick that no one cares about NFTs anymore, though. I do enjoy that. <laughs> it's very fun. Has anyone created a, a like a how much did they lose website that just has a summary of like that would be very entertaining. Who lost the most money on NFTs? That would be sweet. <laughs> more, more, more. Let's yeah, go. I don't. Yeah, I really just don't see a solution. And anyone who thinks that nope. the current solution on Twitter is an actual solution is has missed the boat. Is it better than not? Is it better than not having it? Absolutely not. 
having like one ego driven billionaire who's the arbiter of you know what is what is truth and what is you know right um is is not actually not a solution that's that that's that's actually medieval <laughs> like no <laughs> yeah next one yep hey dll you pretty much have a rapid prototyping team for anything you can think of with the specs of four framework modules being open source what's a module you'd like to make looking forward to ltx oh a module man i don't know my framework laptop already kind of does everything that I need it to do other than, you know, oh, it'd be great if someone could make a way to plug an RJ45 jack into it without it having a, you know, butt hanging off of the bottom. I mean, yeah, great. Like, that would be awesome. But I don't have a solution for that, at least not anything durable. So I don't know. I can't think of anything particularly. It has the modules that I would want if I was configuring one. It has the things that I would want. Yeah. No, no, like cup holder or anything? Cup holder? I mean, they're this big, Dan. What kind of cup are you going to put in it? Oh, it's like it expands out. Uh, next up. Okay. Luke and Linus, what is a past purchase price that you often compare new purchases to or that was particularly good value? Two of mine were a PS3 for $300 and Test 3 Morrowind for $1. So this includes deals. Um, My perception of value crystallized in, I think, about 1996 <laughs> when a uh, a candy bar from the dollar store cost $1. Yeah. And so nowadays, um, I basically can't, I can't get myself to buy snacks unless they're like a buck or maybe like $2. It's very funny. Or I funny. have a really hard time with it. It's very funny to me that you brought up the candy bar for a dollar thing because... Yeah. A can of pop being a dollar, a candy bar being a dollar, and gas being like under a dollar is singed in my brain. Yeah. If I see a chocolate bar that's more than a dollar, which is all of them. No, it's not. Really? Yeah. They're, you, you, in the in the packs at like Superstore, they're like 80 cents. Oh, but you have to buy like a bunch of them, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. But I'm well, talking like a single one. I'm just saying a, a dollar candy bar is absolutely still a thing. Sustainable. Yeah. I But when I see that on the shelf, single chocolate bar, especially when they're like 250 Yeah. When you get like the fancy ones, I just immediately are just like, oh, I used how? I used vending machines until about grade eight. And that's when they moved from a dollar to a dollar 25 for a soda. And I was like, that's too much. I guess I just don't drink this anymore. <laughs> it's probably good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was the best thing that ever happened to me was vending machines. Vending machine prices in, going up. Increasing past <laughs> one loony. Yeah. Okay, up next. Linus, with Call Me Chris moving because of stalking, all accredited to her showing her place in a house tour, has this changed your mind about how you shoot videos at your home? Not really. I mean, I am not subject to the same kind of I guess scrutiny um, that Chris is, uh, which is which is very lucky. I'm very grateful for that. I don't know whether it's audience composition or uh, being male or um, being a tech channel rather than something like where people form more intense parasocial relationships. Uh, some combination of all those factors, other factors I haven't considered. Um, but the, the address of my place of work has been common knowledge for eight years. Um, I ain't hard to find. Nobody does it, which is good and right. I mean, that type of thing has been true for a long time, like TV stations. Like you just, I mean, you could literally often walk behind the glass on like the ground floor TV stations and like wave into the camera. Like this type of stuff has been possible for a while. Hopefully. And most people are not creeps. Yeah, most. They exist, but yeah. But some of them are. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very grateful to our community for not being awful people. Um, yeah, no, I, I can't say it's really changed my mind about anything because if I couldn't make videos about what I'm doing... Would you even watch them? Like I, that's the whole, that's the whole point, right? It's YouTube. It's not 
fabrication tube, right? Yeah, it's, it's a really bad situation, though. You want She'll get one? a better paint job at the new place. Yeah. <laughs> we can only hope. Chris, if you're watching, I will happily... I will happily help you out with your painting. The last collab was fantastic, so that'd be fun. Yeah, I'm down. We'll, we we won't build a computer this time because that was painful, <laughs> but we'll paint. More? Yes? Yep. Yeah, okay. I mean, this is the rest of the show, Dan. That's you got to prompt me, Heather. I keep interrupting you. Um, no, no, you're good. Just talk okay. over us. You're trying to get this thing done, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, boss. Okay. Uh, <laughs> wondering how the pool at Linus's house is coming along. I curated along. this. I curated this. How's I certainly didn't. <laughs> Wait, is it the... There you there go. You go. Oh, oh, you got you to blow a raspberry as well. Jeez. Oh. So, um, yeah, how's it going? Sounds good. Yeah, Seems I'm sure okay. perfectly. If everything goes according to plan, well, see, this is a very first world problem, but it's just a ridiculous problem. Instead of laying all the tiles one way, some of the t the tiles on the sides go this way, and the tiles on the ends go that way. They offered to redo it, and we're just like, no, just just get it done, please. Oh. If everything goes according to plan, it will be ugly but finished in three weeks. I don't believe it. I've heard this before. Oh, yeah. I um, I don't know. I'm on the fence, man. I don't know whether to name and shame these guys at the end. I'm very tempted, though. They've basically done every scummy contractor trick in the book. Um, and some that weren't in any books that I read because I don't read impolite books like that. I, I like... To a certain degree... I think you probably should. Well, here's the problem. Because they shouldn't be able to do that. To um, others. I want them to never do business again. Yeah. Right? Like based on what's gone on. But here's the thing. Based on what I've gleaned about their operation and what I can assume to be at least a, a reasonably accurate guess, um, I think that they are in dire straits right now and are using funding from one project to work on another and then collecting money from that and then using that to continue to work on the other. And they're kind of bouncing around between job sites right now. So if I destroy their means to collect any more money at all, um, I could be ultimately screwing over some of those clients as well. Do I have a responsibility for that collateral damage? He has to throw up Sorry, just thinking there? about it. He's very conflicted feeling right now. He's, oh, what, what did you eat? Not on the That's carpet. That's disgusting. Not on the carpet. What? That's my crying carpet. Oh, were you insinuating I was like farting or something? Throwing up. Ah, yes. Very stinky. Um, yeah, I don't know. But at the same time, they could be acquiring new customers. Yeah. So then it's a tough spot to be in for sure. If they, in good faith, are just going through a bad time and trying to use the new customers to get everything done and they're like going to try and get caught up. Do you think that's what's happening? No. Yeah, because it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't know. It's rough. Yeah. Okay, next up. Hi, LD. I work in an environment with, a, with very few tech-savvy people and a lot of efficiency issues. How would you approach trying to get through the resistance to tech we experience with publishing? Huh. Um, with publishing? I don't know. You just kind of have to wait for people to retire out at a certain point. Like people are, people can be pretty set in their ways and it's not constructive, but there's a, there's a, I, I, I forget what this, you know, law or this bias or whatever is called, but there's a, there's sometimes a lot of um, a lot of justifiability to the "well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it" approach. Yeah, like we create a lot of inefficiencies by by just throwing more tech at the problem, right? Like it, it cuts both ways, but largely, you're probably right that a little more tech would go a long way. But how to fix it? I don't know. It's tough. I was actually meant to make this a topic. Um... And maybe I'll hijack this message and turn it into a topic right now. But I went to uh, NASA at Houston yeah. last, last 
technically sort of weekend and also earlier this week. I wasn't going to say it because I wasn't sure if you were going to talk about it for whatever reason, but yeah, no, 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 it sounded like a sick trip. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely yeah. incredible. The, the, the people that brought us down there, the, the like two main people that, that, well, the main person who reached out is a part of the like mission control center design group sick it has a different name i believe it's called flight operations but basically they design so each mission has a slightly different mission control center because they're going for like these crazy efficiency levels and there's different demands and all this type of stuff so they will design a new mission control center for every mission and i sort of thought that there was like one and like i know like spacex has one but i thought nasa had like a mission control center i don't know why i thought that i just did no, there's like a bunch. Oh, that's They're all cool. in the same building, but there's a bunch. And when you walk through them, they are, they're a little bit different because they're slightly different demands. And these people have to try to push new tech onto these operators that will have to now train on this new tech right. and use it. So they, this might be someone who has worked this one very hyper intense we talked about like the things that they have to do. You have to listen to the loop of all conversations going on and pull out keywords that might involve something that you have to do. So you're constantly listening to multiple conversations at a time and have to be operating at like really, really well, high levels. Life critical of, level. Yeah, yeah. Just your whole shift. <laughs> really, really intense. So like if you want to push uh, a new keyboard setup. Sure, yeah. You're going to type Dvorak setup. now. Yeah, like... It, there's probably going to be a lot of resistance and right. with pretty good reason. You might have good reasons too, right? This is more efficient. We think you can do it this way. So you can get this thing done with slightly less clicks. You can do whatever, blah, 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 blah. This mouse is faster, whatever. But if something is battle tested already, there's a lot of resistance because, I mean, it's not broken and like lives are on the line. Lives and billions of dollars. <laughs> so like... It's tough. Very, very interesting conversations. I think you should absolutely go make videos there. I met a PR person, talked to them about it. They're interested. What I really want to do is the first manned mission to uh, either to go around the moon or to land on the moon. I want to have you work with these mission control center designer oh. guys to make a video on how you design the like computer and electronics and networking oh, and video feeds sick. and everything for a mission control center for a manned launch, which is like way more intense than an unmanned launch. To be clear, um, Luke is super, not super a moon cool. landing denialist. He meant the first moon landing mission in a long oh, time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, well, okay. What I was really talking about was uh, the first one where they set up a base. I, I just, yeah. I'm sure I said it poorly. Yeah. I'm a little bit too excited because it was an extremely fun trip. Yeah, you're good. Um, but yeah, they were talking about like the difficulties there, but also the understanding that like like there's reasons why these people would push back and yeah. it is actually a good thing because you kind of end up in the With middle balance and they are constantly like they have this one display which is a like control center from yeah. like uh i shouldn't say a control center uh, uh an individual person's control unit in a mission control center they have one, like three of them from three different generations yeah and like you can see the similarities between like the first ones that they have and the ones that they have now yeah but they have made a but lot there's of been evolutionary changes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess having the, that push and pull is uh, a very natural thing. Like it's kind of like how um, you know we have departments that are incentivized, that are given incentives that are opposed to each other. You know, for example, the business team has the objective of generating as much sponsorship revenue as possible, but the content team has the objective of getting as many views as possible. Well. Surely Sometimes the most profitable thing pose. would be to just upload sponsor read after sponsor read. And the most viewable thing would be to have no sponsors whatsoever and just make whatever you want. So you got to kind of... You need this back and forth yeah. to land in the right spot. So it's, it's very interesting. And the writing team has um, output targets, but then I have quality targets. And so does the editing team. And so it's like, well, yeah, we, sure, we could output more, but we can't output that. So you're going to have to go back to the drawing board then. Yeah. Yeah. Luke denies Luke, lunar landing confirmed. Yep. 100%. I just said it wrong. Someone you guys said, believe in the moon? Wake some, up, sheeple. Samsung proved it's fake. 
Captain Rand in full plane chat said 75% of the planet is water and none of it is carbonated. The earth is flat. I thought that was really funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's the first time I've heard that. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> okay. Wow. But yeah, that was an actually incredible trip. There's a few other ideas that I have for, for content pieces you might be able to make around that, uh, but we'll we'll talk later. But they're all like super cool. I was trying to pitch AV1 um, because like, you know, network connections can be kind of yeah. rough, uh, but there's like a lot of issues he was talking to me about, and this totally makes sense, but radiation in space is like way more of a problem. Right. We have issues down here when there's like a solar flare, you might have bit flips. Yeah, well, they have those problems like just all the time. Right. And they have they have like space weather experts that can try to predict this stuff coming up, but it still doesn't help you from a bunch of bit flips all happening at the same time. Right. Um, and like there's also cosmic radiation that comes from not just the sun, so you can't necessarily see it coming. Uh, and they, they set up systems where like they'll have three computers doing the same things and they'll vote on a result instead of just having one computer control it. So oh, like wow. if two of them agree or hopefully all three of them agree, then you can be pretty sure that it's good, but it's decently common that one of them will be like bit flipped and just be like, Oh, this other thing. So I, I just very interesting, the type of problems that they have to deal with you, which you might not necessarily expect. Um, but apparently AV one is an issue because of licensing agreements, all this type of stuff. Right. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, Dan and Darren, um, we're working on an x-ray machine. You're what for the lab. Yes. Yeah, I want one. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Kind of sick. Yeah. All right. My whole thing with the lab is I never want the excuse to be you didn't give us the proper equipment. <laughs> don't don't say that publicly. I already did. Oh. Say it again. I never want the excuse to be that I didn't give you the proper equipment. Good. That's a great approach. Yeah. I love it. Uh, okay. Next up. Hello, Linus and Luke. I recently inherited a micro cloud server, the Supermicro 939-20. 12 rails with two Xeons, RAM, and storage on each rail. Any ideas what I should do with it in my home? <laughs> Is that 24 CPUs? What are 12 rails? 12 individual blade servers. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it was just... Oh. So he's got 12 individual servers with two Xeons in them each. Um, wow. Uh, Micro cloud. It looks like it's a 4U unit. Uh, wow. Yeah, so I, don't know. I can't even find that model. 939-20. Yeah, I, I, I cannot find that. Um, and the idea is what I should do with it for my home. Hmm. With that kind of power consumption, <laughs> no. I might. I mean, you could use one of them as like a you know a Plex server or something, maybe. But the reality of it is, like, uh, you know, uh, you could definitely use them for learning still. You know, if you wanted to, um, like, if you wanted to just learn about storage and configure them, or if you wanted to use them to create a whole bunch of clients and learn about Active Directory. Like, I don't know. There's a reason people build home labs, but uh, in terms of practical use for it, pretty hard to say. There's a, I'm going to jump back. Sorry, I'm excited about this topic. Uh, someone in full plane chat said, they use specialized power PC processors that are radiation hardened and are manufactured on older process nodes. Um, I think some of them are based on the power PC G3, which was also used in a 1998 iMac. Yeah. So we didn't talk about the specific processors, but we did talk about how some modern process nodes can be an issue because right. when they have a bit of radiation come in, that's going to flip a bunch of bits, having the transistors further apart yep. can actually help less data problems. Right. right. Like, that makes it, sense. Very interesting. Also, they were talking about how just in general, a lot of older hardware has less problems with radiation. That makes sense. For just, a bunch of different reasons. bigger, fatter traces. Yep. That's uh, And those things not thing. being made is like actually a, an issue for NASA moving forward. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So no idea what you're going to make them do with this micro cloud server? I, I don't yeah, want to be a party pooper, but like I said, just probably sell it. Yeah, it's a bit of a ridiculous thing. Uh, hi, Linus. You're the best. What's your opinion on some of the concept tech products? I really like the Nothing Phone 2 concept. First of all, no. 
Um, I, I think I'm all right. But uh, the best is, wow, that's thank you, but no. Um, nothing phone two. I actually haven't seen oh. this. Mm, and what what's your on some of the concept tech products? Concept. What makes it a concept? Concept renders. Um, all right. Well, here, let's have a look here. Okay. I mean, yeah, it looks pretty cool, I guess. Uh, I don't know which other things you're, um, you're saying are, are concept products, but yeah, that looks pretty cool. We can move on, I think. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, Luke, Linus, and Dan. Do you think that the work Valve has put into DVXK plus Proton can be applied to Mac OS? What with the uh, metal to Vulkan translation layer, Molten VK? Why does Apple lock out gamers? I can't figure out what Apple has against gamers, to be Me perfectly either. honest with you. It's baffling, especially when you consider that on the one hand, they do totally recognize that gaming is a huge market and even a huge revenue source for them now uh, through the App Store, through Apple Arcade. I, 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 I can't fathom it. Yeah. Um, Especially when, like, they didn't they own? No, I don't think they owned Bungie. But like, Halo was initially going to be a Mac exclusive. Yeah, they had ton tons of exclusive games back in the day. Yeah, and now nowadays it's like watching a bunch of you know boomers who have never touched a video game when they do gaming demos on stage. It's it's bizarre. Like it it wasn't like that. If you watch Apple keynotes from like back in the nineties, they talked about gaming. Gaming was a thing. I I have no idea what happened. Um, as for like a translation layer, I mean, yeah, I guess, but uh, I I wouldn't put the work into it, honestly. By the way, I missed something on the store earlier. We now have women's V-necks. Oh, cool. Yeah. So this uh, sketchy PC design is available in an actual like women's shirt. Okay, sorry, that was it. <laughs> Dan, hit me. Sorry, I was just responding to some more. Um, let's see. There are many things I would like to do this year. There are many things I would like to do this year. Despite GPT helping me become more efficient, I am still barely able to get my basic stuff done. How do you manage your time to run LTT plus the other LLCs? Yeah. Um a lot of help, right? I have a hundred people that help me do it. So it's, I don't think I do a great job of managing my time these days. He agrees, but he's busy typing. So he's not really listening to what I'm saying. No, but I do agree. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know what, uh, I don't have a solution. So I try not to complain about it too much because I've tried to get over that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like impossible to meet about you, uh, meet with you about important things. Uh, like the full play meeting this week got canceled. And it's just like, man. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, I again, I don't have a solution for it. It's just tough. Hit me. Sure. Um, that's all basically all I've got for curated. Um, you guys have lots of potentials uh, to go through still. Um, let's just start firing through them. Okay, which 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 end am I eating from? Oh, um, you go from the bottom if you want. Okay. Um, Ryan's. I, oh. Oh. Am I supposed to read them out or not? I, I, however you want to do this. You can either reply to them via text or we can read them out rapid fire. Interesting. I don't think we've decided on that. I think while we're doing other merch messages, you guys kind of go through the potentials. Um, by the way, a uh, good suggestion came in through merch messages. We should switch the lo the logo to like a WAN show after dark logo or something cool like that. Yeah, I've already put it on my to-do oh, list to, awesome. to have a look at that. Thanks, I thought that Dan. was great. Uh, C. Ryan T. says, I enjoy WAN show more when there's fewer questions and more discussion about them. Have you thought about cutting off merch messages halfway through the show and switching to an upvote system? Upvote system is a pretty cool idea. However, the curation that we're doing is not just based on what people want to see because we end up with a lot of duplicate stuff we'd end up with a lot of 
uh, just, you know, what the latest drama is. I think it would really change the tone of merch messages over time when we're going out of our way to create a particular tone to the discussion. Um, as for switching them off halfway, I don't think we would want to do that from a business standpoint. We definitely want people to order from LTT store. Uh, so turning them off is bad, but I, li I like the idea. I like where it's coming from. I think if we were going to do an upvote system for questions, we'd probably just do another AMA. It's been kind of a while. Yeah. Something like that could make sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, well build an AMA system and then no. we'll do it on flip. Alrighty then. <laughs> you could just make a post asking for questions and you could reply to them like a Reddit thread if you wanted. Can I just shout out our team that works on merch messages real quick here? Team. <laughs> yeah, I know. But like... You know, Good job, Conrad. <laughs> gotta give credit to the team, you know? There, I uh, mean, there, there is other people involved yeah. technically. But yeah. It, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is really cool. This was sitting in incoming and I almost finished replying to it and someone moved it into potential. So it disappeared. And that text is still here. So all I had to do was add S to my signature, and now I have replied to it. Super cool. You're supposed to be doing potentials, not incoming. I am doing potentials. See, they moved it into... Oh, I see. <laughs> yes, I screwed that up. Uh, Anonymous asks, I'm, in, I'm a 20-something wanting to start a YouTube business. What keeps you going during the difficult times? And if things didn't work out, at what point do you just call it and move on? I can get along being jobless. Um... Okay, what keeps you going during the difficult times? I mean, for me, the biggest thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is that if I don't come here, other people will have nothing to do and will ultimately lose their jobs. Um, there are definitely times, I mean, when I posted the I'm thinking of retiring video, I probably would have just done it if it wasn't for the responsibility to the team. I, I, had, I was either debt-free or I had, a, I had being debt-free on the horizon that is no longer the case. <laughs> um, but at that time, I did. Um, and just, you know, was, was feeling, I was feeling pretty unmotivated. But if I quit, then everyone quits, which sucks. That's stupid. So here I am, right? As for if it doesn't work out, at what point do you call it? I'd say when you stop enjoying it, because the thing about YouTube is that you've got to find a passion. And like I said in that video, I just had to find a different framing device for my passion. I had to get passionate about something different. And if I hadn't been able to do it, I would have had to call it. So if you're just not passionate about it anymore, there's no way you're going to be able to create passion in others. So it's time to, it's probably time to call it. Okay, I've got a curated one here for you. Hit me. Hi, DLL. I recently screen shared a chat where we were talking trash about a vendor on a call with that vendor. What's your most embarrassing screen share moment? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that's this isn't bad. a screen share, but uh, something that I used to do when playing. Okay, so this is like back in the day when we used a, a program called Ventrilo. This is far before uh, the, the discords of the world, but it's it's essentially discord, but a super long time ago. Cool kids used mumble. <laughs> Go but on. There was, a, there was a run flag that you could put on Ventrilo so you could open more than one of them. And you could join two different servers at the same time. And if you uh -oh. set up your keybinds in a certain way, uh -oh. you could you could mic up for one of them and not mic up for the other one. So if you're playing like classic WoW in 2004, uh, and you and your buddies are in a raid with 40 other people, and you want to be in the comms for the main raid, because you're supposed to be or whatever, and then you want to be in comms with just you and your friends, so you can like um, just talk trash or do whatever, uh, pressing the wrong key bind mm -hmm. and saying something could be bad. Right. Yep, and that happened. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> I actually can't really think of anything right now. I've definitely... Bad screen shares? You've leaked stuff on WAN. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's That was pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was the time that I leaked uh, everyone's salaries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. How ironic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. 
Back to potentials. That's the only curator I've got. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sean asks, we just celebrated our dog's first birthday. Uh, might be a little spoiled. Do y'all celebrate birthdays or got ya days for your pets? Uh, no, not personally. Me neither. I actually don't know how old Dash is. And there's no excuse because we know when she, we knew when she was born at some point. <laughs> Just like, I don't know. She's a cat. <laughs> I love her, but she's a kitty. I, how old is she? Cat? I, kitty? <laughs> meow. <laughs> Emma, Emma likes to tell this story where I was hanging out with her family and one of her family members asked me, um, how young my brother's daughter was. And I said, under a year old. <laughs> yeah, Luke and I are not particularly detail-oriented people. <laughs> Speaking of which, Mother's Day is coming. Two-week warning. Ah, good. For those of you out there who are also not particularly detail-oriented. <laughs> I'm going to put I, that in my calendar immediately. I didn't know anything was wrong with that response. Everyone looked at me weird and I was just like, what? And then she ended up informing me later that like... Yeah, it's it's in months yeah, at this point. Everyone does months. Up until about 24 months, everyone does months. Yeah. Because the development is so fast. Yeah. No, I'm sure. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. Any more in potential? I mean... Uh, I might as well just read one, too. Yeah, yeah. Just, just find yeah, ones just, to read. Or just scroll to here. Uh... Let's see. Uh, well, going back to our headline topic, what should they have done to foster more Canadian content creators? Fund it. Like, I'm not against. I'm not against funding content, but there's got to be a process for um, either, you know, taking content that's starting to snowball and trying to pour gas on the fire, or um, you know, finding people that are in some kind of. Uh, yeah, I guess okay, I guess for me, I I'm not I'm not that into handouts. So, you know, finding people who are or organizations who are already trying and seeing a little bit of success, like have 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 gotten the ball rolling a little bit and trying to get balls rolling faster, I guess is where where I'd like to see it. I don't think that it should be going to giant established media companies and I don't think it should be going to people who can't even be arsed to you know, try turning on their selfie camera and recording something. I think there's a middle ground there. Okay, here's another one. Job roles say Canada only. Is that a hard requirement? Was looking at the roles and felt like I had the experience, but I'm UK based. Would happily relocate given political reasons. Uh, I, w I was typing out a response to this. Not all of the job roles say Canada only, because uh, some of them are not Canada only. Um, there are developer positions that are open to uh, non-Canadian remote work. The ones that do say Canada only, you need to currently, right now, and there's a lot of people that, in my opinion, intentionally misinterpret this, but you need to currently, this exact second, need to legally be able to have a job in Canada. I do not mean you are eligible to apply for immigration. I mean, you are already legally able to have a job in Canada. That is possible without being a Canadian citizen. Almost all the time, it's going to mean that you live here already. Not technically, though. So there is that window of opportunity. Yep, but you if could you're be like a Canadian citizen who's living abroad, yeah, or or there are there are other weird like work visa. Yeah, set Dennis up had things. a work visa because he went to school here. Yeah, there's other there's other situations Even where that it ended might... up being a nightmare and costing a lot of money and taking a lot of time. So like it will very likely um, hurt chances. Like I, I don't know. It's it's a huge nightmare if you don't already have the ability to work here. So yeah, unless like I already said the role doesn't say that and is open to uh, working from outside the country. What are you going to go see opening night? Barbie or Oppenheimer? Barbie. No question. And neither, actually, but Barbie. <laughs> Why not both? Double feature. I don't go to, neither of us really go to movies that often. No. Yeah, I saw the Super Mario movie just because my family wanted to go. Yeah. And actually, they only wanted to go because another family invited us, 
to go because they were taking their kids. So I got dragged along by drag-alongs. It's the only reason I saw it in the theater. Otherwise, I would have just watched it at home. My favorite thing about watching movies in the last, like, while has been when Linus and I go, which is extremely uncommon, and the actual favorite part about it is when we just, like, sit in the car afterwards and talk the whole movie. Um, <laughs> which, like, if that's the reason you're going, it's almost never going to be worth going. Which Star Wars movie did we do that for? I don't remember. I can't remember, but it was awful. <laughs> yeah. I don't... I th was it the first one? No. No, I don't think so. It must have been the second must one. must have been the second one. Yeah. Because it was... You know, <sighs> pretty much every week I get into it with David about <laughs> stupid The Last... Skywalker or whatever that stupid movie is called and he's, he he's like it went places with storytelling and it, creativity and I'm just like I know David doesn't have a movie podcast anymore so he doesn't have a way to defend himself uh well that, I, that, no actually does he still have one I think he does is it, is it movies still I, I mean don't he know. definitely has a podcast still but yes. it's not here uh, <laughs> anyway the point is uh, so I'm definitely taking a cheap shot here but no David it's awful <laughs> It's awful and made no sense. It just, it just did random things. It's the equivalent of you know elementary school kids being like, "Mom, you know, it would be cool if like this happened." Which one was this? The this was the Ryan Johnson one, the middle so one. So the middle one yeah. isn't that the one where they're like, "They fly now." Yeah. Yeah, that line will always drive me nuts. They already flew. It's not a new thing. R two D two flew, depending on which headcanon you subscribe to. <laughs> There's a lot of those at this point. Yeah. Maybe it was the third one. It must have been the third one that we went off on. I, either, I mean, they were both terrible. I so don't remember. Whatever, I don't know what to say. Yeah. That was really loud. That knuckle crack. Yikes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yikes. I'm still having a lot of issues with this joint. Oh really? So it gets really tight very often. Have yeah, you tried I need, rolling it. I might need to, <laughs> I might need to go get like X-rays. There might be actually oh, something really? wrong with the bone. Yeah, because it like should have, if it was tendons or whatever, it should have healed by now. Anyways, it's fine. I got another curated here for you. All right. I have a two-year-old. How did you introduce your child, uh, children, to video games and computers? Honestly. We just kind of made it up as we went along. Um, some of it was out of laziness. So we would often give our phones to our son who woke up a lot earlier than us. Um, but man, this was before I had YouTube premium. I was just, it existed. I was just too cheap to pay for it. Uh, so he would wake me every time there was an ad. <laughs> so it really didn't get me much extra sleep. But we would put on like phonic song um, and, and all these... Why like, would he wake you? Like nursery, because he didn't have the motor skills or understanding to, to click skip. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't get it yet. So I'm pretty sure that that channel, I forget what it's called, like ABC One Two Three or something. I don't remember what it's even called, but like Phonics Song, Phonics Song Two. Um, I, I could probably still sing these songs like word for word, and it's been like eight years. I'm traumatized, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that's a significant part of the reason that our firstborn read like extremely early. Um, and like his numeracy is like still off the charts. Um, so that's probably a predisposition at that point, but, but he read extremely early. It was really impressive. And, uh, I, so I have no regrets about that. As for like gaming though, we waited a long time. My rule for my kids has been, you're not really allowed to play video games until you can read a, because I don't think you need to play video games when you're two and B, because I don't want to help you. I don't want to just stand there and like help you navigate a menu or like to help you figure out what's going on when you're supposed to be like talking to another character or whatever else. Um, we right now our system is we make them trade developing their minds in some other way for video game time. So I think it's a two to one trade. So I think if you do half an hour of actual piano practice, then you get an hour of gaming time. Not just bonking keys. Yep. You have to actually be working on what your teacher said to work on. Um, and there's a couple of other things that you can trade for video game time. And it seems to work reasonably well for us right now. It's a bit of a pain to keep track, track. of. Track. Yeah. But overall, I'm pretty happy. My kids, you know, aren't completely ignorant to technology, but they're also just not constantly glued to the boob tube. So. Cool.
So you yeah. find when you're not editing. Oh. Uh, do you have any experience with Palo Alto firewalls? If so, what are your thoughts? No. Nope. Any news on shipping for European customers? I thought you mentioned a while back you might be looking to make it a better experience. We'd love to. We'd still love to. It's still complicated and still expensive, and we still have a lot of other things to work on. Sorry. Any updates on products that are under development or that you're excited about? Oh. Um, Don't leak too much. Oh, yeah. Stick locks are coming really soon. That's really exciting. They're the little Stick joystick locks. covers. Oh, those, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those should be launched, like, imminently. Really excited for those. Didn't even know we were developing those. Yeah, they're really cool. I have decided to change course in my career, and I'm going into a coding boot camp soon, pursuing software engineering. Do you know anyone that has done something similar and found success? Luke, this one's for you. Um, so it's, they, they went to a boot camp, and they're, now they want a career? Is that they're, the... they're going to a boot camp. Yeah. And they're wondering if this is a good move. Uh, yeah, but it's a it's a very uh, it's not it's it's much more similar to training yourself online, in my opinion, than it is to going and de getting a degree. Because by doing that boot camp, you're kind of like using this thing to try to help move you along the path, um, believing that your first steps are important to be guided. That's, in my opinion, the way that you should take it. So from there, you still kind of need to build a good portfolio because just having, like, a lot of boot camps are various lengths, so I don't know how long that one is. But if you're like, I have a two-month boot camp, uh, that's going to mean effectively nothing to me if I'm trying to hire you. But if you're like, I have a two-month boot camp, you can kind of ignore that part. My portfolio is really cool. Look at these things. That can mean a lot. Um, I know a few other hiring people. If someone has a, a degree, at least a bachelor's, four-year degree, that's kind of like a check mark um, to move them forward. And things that equate with that are often portfolio or experience, not some boot camp thing. So use the boot camp to make something cool, and then you can you can get there. Hi, Luke and Linus. Uh, since you have started producing your own physical products, how has your experience with other physical products influenced your design or development of digital products? Um, Those teams don't work together. I guess you do. You're on no, I don't think I read that wrong. How has your experience with physical products influenced your design or development? Of, yeah, okay. Yeah. Of digital ones. Physical to digital. I don't know. I mean, ugh. I... For me, it's it's always just. Uh, I'm very know. thankful that the customer support isn't as hard for digital ones. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that that's really good. Um, the only person that crosses those team lines is Linus. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, so much of our development is just how I would want it to be, <laughs> and so that's the same whether it's a digital product or a yeah. physical product. That is true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I got an, I got a curated one here that's really cool. Um, completely blind LTT viewer here. Love the WAN show for my tech news. Cool. What are your thoughts on the rise of, of the accessible games for the blind, such as the new Forza? What? I might be biased, but cool stuff. How do they do that? It has some really cool features that just make it more... Um... No way. Like high, high, I think there's like a high contrast mode. There's, Microsoft. Oh, so this includes like legally blind, so you can still see a little bit. Microsoft has done a lot. They don't do everything Absolutely. right, but they've done a lot to push accessible gaming yes, forward. And that's super cool. Every time we talk about it, we're just like, yes, great work. Do that. Do more. Um, you know, whether I think you know, we're all a little different. And whether your difference is obvious from the outside or not, um, I think gaming is one of the ways that people of all types can come together and enjoy their time together. I mean, we did an executive retreat recently. Um, and Mage quit. Yeah. One of the big highlights for me was just all playing games together. Um, you know, I don't, I, I think it's a very old fashioned outlook to think of video games as, you know, 
uh, you know, they're bad for you, rot your brain or whatever. It's a social experience, right? It's, I don't think it's any different from playing a board game um, necessarily. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that making that experience more inclusive is a, a noble goal and one that Fantastic. might not make sense financially, but that shouldn't matter. You should just do it anyway. I've deeply respected Microsoft's efforts in this regard. I'm not surprised it's happening to Forza because that's a Microsoft title. Their accessibility controller, I don't believe it's called that, but whatever it's called, is like actually an incredible piece of hardware. And the fact that they still support it and make it and all that kind of stuff is just wildly cool. Okay, I've got another curated one here. Hi, LLD. I've been with my significant other for four years and plan on proposing soon. Do you have any advice for picking a ring? Uh, P.S. Go float plane. Hey. I'm going to be honest with you. I I am not the kind of person who makes major decisions without my wife. And the ring was a major decision. I mean, that was a really significant amount of money for us, especially at the time. And not even just the money, but the way to do it, whether it's... Uh, like a like a metal ring or whether it's tattoos or whether it's uh whether we even want rings at all um and if you're gearing up to spend the rest of your lives together i think that it's probably a good habit to get into to talk to each other and work together on a solution that makes you both happy so the answer would be to not ask me uh but to but to show a genuine interest and work with your wife or SO or, you know, whatever, whatever title you guys use for each other and, and find something that makes you both happy. Okay, we've got our last six here, if you guys want to push through them. Um, you can hear the pain in his voice. And just... now you don't have to, you can see it on his face. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I don't want to get yelled at anymore. Uh, hey, Linus, I love your commitment to quality and LTT products and that you'd rather do it right and not do it at all. Or not do or, it at all. Change, that changed the meaning there, Dan. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I gotta like have it wider so that I can actually parse these easier. Um, is there anything you credit to? Uh, upbringing, etc. I wish this was more common. <laughs> you butchered that, man. Jesus. Um, let's try that again. Sure. Let's just let's just do that one more time. One, one more time. time. Hey, Linus, I love your commitment to quality in LTT products and that you'd rather do it right or not do it at all. Is there anything you credit this to? Your upbringing, etc.? I wish this was more common. I'm a cheapskate, and I hate wasting money. And I consider anything that breaks too fast or or sucks for how much I paid for it is a bad value, I consider that to be a waste of money. And if I don't like wasting my own money, then I have to assume that you don't like wasting money either. I would toss in an additional argument, uh, which is that he's going to extensively use anything that we make. If mm. we make shirts, he's gonna have to wear them like all the time. Literally every day. I'm also lazy and I hate rebuying things. So if I can have something that just lasts for a very long time, that makes me much happier. Yeah. So I'm I hate wasting money and I hate wasting time and I consider bad products to be a waste of money and time. Yeah. I recently went back and played my childhood favorite, the Wii. That's when I realized the graphics and tracking were a lot worse than I remember. <laughs> yeah. What's your wow, this is actually garbage moment? Uh huh. Mine's so generic. I can do it, but it's so generic. Yeah, do it. I went back to go play Morrowind like over a decade oh, later. How many times have you told that story? Tell I a know. Story. Oh, Man. I told you it's generic. Wow, this was actually garbage. I don't know. The nostalgia filter is so strong. Like I went back and played one of the Hugo games, Hugo's House of Horrors, and it's all, it's objectively bad. The graphics are terrible. The gameplay it's like it's it's a. Uh, it's got a, like a graphical interface, uh, but it's really a text adventure game. And you know the problem with text adventure games is that without the benefit of a large language model or something like that, you often have to just, you have to just Fish sit there for the right keyword. and find yeah the exact right way to steal key, take key, put arm through hole and remove key. Like it's very frustrating. But I still I kind of get joy from it. 
And if anything, more now than I did back then, now that I can just look up the answers on the internet and see what happened with this stupid game I could never beat as a kid because it was impossible. Um, you know, you know, it's a weird thing for me. My nostalgia glasses for graphics are not that bad. Like when I went back to Morrowind, I was like, yeah, this is how I remember it looking. Whatever. When I go back to super old games, I'm never like, oh, I can't believe it's so bad. I always remember how it looks. It's the controls. You know what? Oh, yeah, controls. Oh, okay, yeah, that's one. 007. Yeah. Man. Like, you go and play 64? 007, and you're just like, oh, man. Like, yeah, this is rough. Controlling my character is brutal. Yeah, like, it's no, not the graphics. No wonder, you know, going to my friend's house and playing, like, he always beat me. Like, you have, you have to train in order yeah. to, to operate this thing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd say old control schemes. Yeah, because, like, it took a while for people to figure out, like, ah, okay, yeah, this is how shooters are going to work. Yeah, like, Unre didn't the original Unreal Tournament use, like, A and Z for look up and down? Something like that? Oh, I don't know. Original UT controls. Yeah, because, I mean, looking vertically was not a thing that was a feature on a initial shooter games. Yeah, mouse look. Not a thing. Yeah. Like a, a lot of old shooter games, when you got to a ramp, your character would just like look up it automatically. Like you didn't actually control that. Or uh, the the planes were all actually like equal. So if something was up a ramp, if you shot what would hit the ramp, but in the right direction, the your, your bullets would just like go up <laughs> and hit them. Yeah, no, here we go. Uh, when playing Unreal Tournament, I barely use the mouse unless I'm sniping. All my controls are in the keyboard. Control is fire. Space bar, alt fire. Alt for walk. A to jump. Z to crouch. Page up to look up. Page down to look down. Home to center the view. Q to throw the weapon that you're holding. And W to throw a relic. <sighs> this is just a forum post I found in... Uh, um, ut99.org and so a lot of people are posting these just like by modern standards utterly ridiculous keybind setups yeah Whew. all right <laughs> that's rough right yeah. yeah page up and page down okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah hey when the audio only wan show gets released will it be live and where could people listen to it no. spotify maybe it'll be here It'll be here. Yeah. Yep. As like a VOD, yeah. Yep. Not live and here. With the couple of remote control things that you have done, I found your channel from the fire truck lol. Would you consider a shelf model train layout around your house, considering a DCC setup is very tech advanced? I have wanted to do uh, I actually wanted to build like a like a ceiling suspended train in the kids room just for kind of a fun project it's basically since my first child was born. Well, that's a decade ago now. It hasn't happened yet. So I'm thinking probably it's not going to happen at this point. It's super cool, but I just I can't find the motivation to do it uh when if I'm going to put a bunch of things on the wall or up around the ceiling, I think the way for me to go now is a bunch of like cat perches and, and cat runs and stuff like that. I'd, I'd love to do that in our house. Oh, sorry. I was getting angry messages. Um, finally got my stream deck. Suggest some Wii games uh, for the emulator, please. Wii games on the Steam Deck. Given how prevalent motion controls were for the Wii, I don't think I have a ton of suggestions. The vast majority of my Wii time was Wii Sports, actually. Like, vast majority. Yeah, I bought so other games, but pff, Wii Sports was king. I, I was typing out a response to that, but yeah, in my experience, all the games that I enjoyed with the Wii was because they got me up and got me moving. Wii Sports stuff, what other various interesting control. The Wii was cool because it was a very new thing with the motion controller. The Wii, that that's why the Wii was cool. It wasn't cool because you could control the turn the controller sideways and like play platformers. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'm got a curated one here. So this one's obviously important to Linus. Luke, as a backend developer myself, what is the business benefit for closed source code? In my experience, almost all code written had been done had been done variation of something else that I've already done or exists. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of kind of nebulous things. 
Um, this isn't, yeah, this is a, a lot of people get really spicy about open source closed they source do. stuff. Um, I was, I was curious about your answer. I would bring us back to the star citizen conversation that I often bring up with these types of things, which is where you do stuff more in the light. You get tied up communicating about it instead of just like doing it. Uh, we have contributed to open source projects uh, for things that we use. We want to do more and we'll probably scale up how much of that we do in the future. Um, it, it takes a little bit more care than just, you know, editing it slightly for your own use case and then just running with it. So it, it would take more time, but we do want to give back to those communities. Again, we have done it a certain amount already, but we do wish to do it more in the future. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The, uh, more... The idea that just having open source code means these magical angel developers are just going to come out of nowhere and just do things for you, uh, which is the way that it's communicated surprisingly often, yeah. is not real. Um, there are benefits to open source code. People can find, especially like security problems and suggest things. And if they start using it, they might contribute features and a lot of stuff like that. But if you look into the space, it ends up being... A, a maintainer or a small group of maintainers just needing to fix things for like other people <laughs> and spending a lot of the times dealing with that type of stuff. Um, so, and I think that's honestly most of it. I'm not worried so much about like, oh, someone got our code for whatever. They can do the same thing we're doing. Like that's not really the problem. It's just not the most efficient way of moving forward. Sorry, uh, Domenico, opinion. probably not anytime soon. But yeah, that's going to piss some people off. A bunch of open source people might get mad, but I don't know. I think the open source community is fantastic and we have made contributions. We will make more contributions in the future, but it's not efficient for us to just open source everything and then deal with this insane deluge of incoming communication about all of it. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, yeah, we're a very small team um, and there are, could be benefits because we are a very small team to opening it and that's great. And maybe we'll make something that's open at some point. There's been a few proposals internally. Like, hey, we're making this one tool. This might be a good idea to open source at some point, especially there's been communication around that um, with some of the lab stuff. And maybe that will be a thing. What is going on? Uh, but it's not a thing right now. And with that, the show is not a thing right now. Wow. Bye! Oh. <laughs> um. Whoops. Yeah, it's... Uh, hmm. I might need some other solution to this. <laughs> okay. Oh, we got one more merch message. The show is brought to you by MSI, Vessi, and AccuFlow. Travis J says, receives my first t-shirt today. Best fit shirt I may have ever bought. Love it. Wow. Bought uh, two more shirts. Excellent.